Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the fifth day of our school. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Lauro Tomiu. Let me give a brief uh, introduction to Lauro so that he has time to, to give his lecture. So he graduated in physics from the, Ferro, the Federal University of Paraná. He has a master's from the IFT Foundation in Sao Paulo. His PhD was in, uh, at the Federal University of Pernambuco. He has a postdoc in the McMaster University, that's in Canada. And uh, currently, he's a volunteer researcher uh, at the uh, State University of Sao Paulo at IFT, since he retired there as being full professor. Uh, his main research interests are few body quantum systems, uh, atomic condensates, nuclear reactions and scattering, and QCD, QCD models. So, Lauro, thank you for accepting our invitation. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation for to present this lectures no? that uh, I'm going to talk about. I want to reach, I think, this some about atom dynamic co ultra cold collisions near the unitarity. Uh, as he told me already about from where I am in the Institute of Physical Theory. Okay. Here I want to give some memory of two great friends that we lost in the last three years. Now. One is Antonio Delfino, that was a colleague of Tobias, myself, and the people from the community knows him very well. Yeah. And the other one that I last year is, is Dorokovna, Antonio Alexander Dorokovna. He's a lead in research in the Bogolubov Institute and the editor in chief he was the physical mentor part in Atomic Nucleus. I'm saying this because not everybody knows him, but I have many collaborations with this uh, guy, Alexander Dorokov. So I want to present his memory for, the, for them. So I'm, uh, as he told something about, we start really the group in, uh, first in Pernambuco in 1980s. Uh, in, the, in the group of Helio Coelho and Sadan Adikari, and where from that time, I know Antonio Delfino, and also Tobias Frederico joined to some, at that time, I think in 1984, since 86. And after I moved for a, some time to QCD with Yuki Nogami in Canada, Dishnu Day also, India, and Dorokov from Russia. They, these people came to Brazil also as visitors many times. Particularly, Dorokov came, I think, to about three times. Once he stayed here uh, more than one year. Now. Okay. And in the last uh, period, I, we concentrate more in few body systems from atoms to bose ice condensation. In a collaboration with Tobias, that continued, and Antonio Delfino also, né, till he left us. Uh, in field body physics, I continue along all my career with this collaboration, in a period that we had several visitors, postdocs, and students. Among the main collaborations, we started their own groups. I should mention also Arnaldo Gamal in USP, Institute of Physical USP, and Marcelo Yamashita in EFT. With Arnaldo, we had uh, really started to work in back and nonlinear physics about 20 years already ago. <laughs> In particular, in this subject, we had relevant contribution of one of the visitors that we had there, Fatkul Abdullaev, from Uzbek Academy of Science. In the last few years, we had several work also with Kishore Kumar, that was a postdoc in Arnaldo's group for a few years, and after came to EFT as a, for a, a few months, I can say, before leaving to Otago's group in New Zealand. My more recent collaboration with Arnaldo is uh, in the works that he have presented here with Alex Andriati and Leonardo Brito, which are part of their PhD thesis. Concerning universal aspects in few body physics and atom diamond study, I should mention also the helpful contribution that I'm going to talk about some contribution here by Wayne De Paula and Lucas, a recent collaboration also that we had with Tobias and Madi Schalchi also as a postdoc in EFT. My, my, uh, my talk will be more concentrated in this last subject. 
Here the place that we have in EFT, Institute of Physical Theorica, is very easy to reach there for people that don't know. It's just take the terminal uh, red line, terminal uh, Palmeiras Barra Funda. Just in the t at the terminal, you can see uh, here is the building, and here is the terminal, and here is the Institute of Arts of the line. But the Institute of Physical Theory is this one. Okay. So it's easy to reach from any kind of uh, metro station there. So now I'm going to introduction of some weekly bound system. And after this is more or less the outline of what I'm going to talk. The impact of cold experiment in few body nuclear fields, mass imbalance at three body near the unitarity, uh, scattering near the unitarity, basic formalism applied to uh, NN core system that we can extend to alpha, alpha, beta general system also, depend on the interaction of this to uh, the identical particles, and cold atom laboratories to probe few body universal prediction, and from back to experiment to ultra cold chemistry, and so on. And at the end, I give some conclusion perspective. These are the outline of the two lectures. No? So this is more or less uh, divided the two lectures in this two parts here. Some introduction. After the FMO effect, there is a strong overlap with uh, Tobias talk that he had uh, presented before here. Uh, anyway, uh, Tobias has presented a bit more, I think, the formalism of uh, Skolnikov thermatilios uh, and so on. That's very helpful, maybe, to understand because what I have done here is uh, this slide is more qualitative. No? So one can say at least and remember this equation that it needs to be solved. No? And after some motivation in ultra cold chemistry. And in the second talk, I will talk about more the collision near the unitarity. Formalism, adiabatic approach, uh, should present here. And after low energy atom dimer scattering with sodium, helium, lithium, six and lithium seven. And after I talk about the reaction, exchange reaction, atom dimer elastic dissociation and exchange reaction. So why are weakly bound system uh, problems interesting? So the interest and relevance of identifying simple universal correlation in few body binding laws are to understand the basic principles of quantum mechanics. In weakly bound to body system, details of the interaction between the particles are found not so relevant to reproduce the corresponding low energy physics because the wave function extends to very far né? so there, for the two-body interaction. Therefore, one can consider a short range or even a point-like Dirac delta interaction for the two-body interaction and parameterize to reproduce low energy observable. In a three-body low energy system, once one three-body observable is given in addition to a two-body parameter, the other observables are found correlated with the first one. So one goal, as uh, started by Bondurgo here, in low energy density systems, such as Bose-Einstein condensation, is to be able to engineer the particle interaction to achieve a quantum system in which the physical behavior is dominated by uh, multiple body interaction. This is the FMOF uh, discovery, mathematic, of course, theoretical is the effect of a three-body phenomenon predicted in 1970. If two bosons becomes bound with exactly zero binding energy, unitary limit, unitary limit means exactly this point here. Né? And the three-body energies are this level here, that this point here. And the ratio between them is analytical. Okay? These are the three-body energy, this is the bound states, and this is a virtual two-body state, and here is the bound two-body state. Né? because the two-body is the inverse of the square of the scattering length, basically. Yeah. And so for a positive, here you have a bound state, and here you have a virtual state. Okay. So in the unitary limit, here the ratio between the three-body levels is given by this fact. This is a definition, of course, fact, but because we can say just that it's 550 between the two energies. Né? But defining this way, you, have, uh, you can find this S0 here, 
as a, a scaling parameter that is given to 1.00 uh, some number there is very close to one. No? Uh, so up to four identical particles, three identical particles. But if it's not identical particles, this factor will change as we are going to see also. So this effect predicts a long disturbance in the nuclear force range was finally verified uh, by Kramer et al. in 2006, evidence for FMOV quantum states in an ultra-cold gas of cesium atom. It was detected uh, as a resonance in measurement of triboids, so it, it came from the side of A negative, né? the combination, valid in the zero energy collision limit at sufficiently low temperature, né? cold enough to justify the zero temperature limit. The effect was confirmed by several other groups, which are looking for the property of such states. Né? So we have a few uh, relevant papers that are published in Nature by Zacanti et al., by the group of Ferlaino also, né? and by a group of Hewlett here, this one. Okay. So fashion back resonance techniques is a very relevant technique in this uh, matter now, because they allow the two-body interaction control. The Fetchback resonance technique was uh, established in 1958, also in nuclear physics, now, were shown to be fundamental to manipulate the two-body interaction. So uh, this was shown by Inoue, application in Bose-Einstein condensation, for example, in Aitro, they said that how to control that, and this is also in a physics report by Timmerman, Tomazini, Hussein, and Kerman, this paper. And after there is a few investigations, more recently that I can mention here, on ultra-cold molecules via flashback mechanism, showing that we can also control this binding of molecules and form, uh, uh, and, and see uh, how flashback resonance are relevant. Now. For example, these are the, about the creation of an ultra-cold gas of ground state dipolar sodium rubidium molecules. And after there is the paper, the path uh, Vogue's at all, a pathway to ultra cold bosonic sodium potassium ground state molecules. And by Green, more recent paper, also 2020, a flashback resonance in P wave, three body, uh, recombination within Fermi Fermi, Fermi mix of open shell, lithium cells, and closed shells, iterbium atoms. So these are basically what is the resonance flashback phenomena. The resonance scattering phenomenon is explored in ultra-cold atomic gas. Alkali atoms interact uh, through short-range van der Waals interaction. Effective strength of the interaction can be tuned by allowing particles to form virtual bound state or resonance. Here is the, the magnetic field that you can change here né, by adjusting the separation between the entrance channel and bound state through external magnetic field. The system can be turned to resonance. Né? So by simply changing the external field. Né? So the, the FMO effect, when generalized, generalized for two kinds of balls with masses M heavy, for example, and ML, in the unitary limit of one of the pairs, the three body levels are related by an exponential scaling factor, the same, uh, the same kind of scaling factor, but with this S0 be dependent of the mass, uh, the mass ratio. S0 is a constant varies according to the mass ratio. Becoming this value complete becomes 550 when the masses are equal. In case, for example, the, the heavy mass is 100 times the light one, the ratio between consecutive levels of the bound state energy spectrum is around 4.7. So as the scaling behavior is better verified for large mass, imbalanced mass, because with this ratio, one is more close one level to the other. So in that case, one should expect more easy to detect this kind of FMOV if we want to see more levels. That is the signal that we have FMOV uh, detected. No? So the result can be relevant in atomic mixture with cold atom laboratories. No? That you for example, mix with a heavy particle with a light one. In the scattering region, the discrete FMOV scaling factor can also be well identified with one atomic species. 
alfa, por exemplo, collide with a dimer of alpha beta system. Heidelberg group is studying the extreme mass imbalance mix composed by cesium and lithium atomic species. In this paper here and these people are uh, active also using other kinds of molecules, but particularly this cesium and lithium they have used. So ultra cold degenerate mix of alkali metal rare molecules like ethereum and lithium have also been considered by these two groups here. Hmm. They are published in PRL and PRA. So it's clear that more favorable conditions are accessible to probe ephemeral physics in cold atom laboratories by considering low energy collision uh, of a heavy atom in a weakly bound molecule. Like, for example, in this case, lithium cesium, the ratio is 0.045. And for lithium ethereum, it's 0.034, the, ra the mass ratio. So here, I'm going to talk about the impact in nuclear physics of this cold atom experiment. So this universal aspect has been known for a long time in nuclear physics studies with few nucleons. So for the nuclear, only the problem that in nuclear physics we cannot change the interaction between the particles. No? So for the nuclear fuel body community, it's quite uh, rewarding to know about experimental verification of the long time predicted female effect. The new facilities coming from cold atom laboratories have opened plenty of other possibilities no? to investigate fundamental aspect of quantum field body system near the unitarity. The relevance to the field body community of this connection to a cold atmosphere with the we can measure some fundamental correlation verified in low energy field nuclear system, which have also been extended to study exotic allo nuclear system near the stability drip line. This fundamental correlation between nucleons are expected to be explored more deeply now through the atomic uh, laboratory facilities. So I'm just, just going to repeat something that uh, maybe already you saw here before, no? but uh, it's about this first, uh, the relation between Thomas collapse and the of effect. Well, Tobias already talked about this, but Tobias, Thomas collapse start uh, just looking for the range of the nuclear interaction, the two neutral interaction. What happened? It takes the one, uh, if it, it takes the range of the, the two bodies, the other going to zero, the triton collapses, goes to minus infinite. Okay? So the ground state collapses if R0 goes to zero. And this, as said also in one book, I think by Bohr, was fundamental to the discover that the, the distance, the, the R0, the, uh, the size of the nucleon, is around one fermi. Okay? That was fundamental just because of this discovery. But after uh, there is the effect of IFMOV that as shown by Tobias here, with the, uh, that can be related with the same kind of equation. It's going to call thermatisms. We use in this relation here, for example. If you put in a dimensional form, né, that is scattering length going to infinite of R0 going to zero. Né? Both going to the same limit. This is what we call Thomas IFMOV effect. In some, play, some people call it this way also. Né? So that way we have also one book about this, né? and also showing that we have only for three parts correlation in, in, three, di in three dimensions, not in two. Né? And these are the Phillips line, I think, one of the corre important correlations that were well known in nuclear physics, in the study of nuclear force. It shows the correlation between the triton binding energy, that is in this side here, and the doublet uh, nucleon deuteron scattering length here. So it took, it took like hundreds uh, of potential models, and it shows that just if you change a little bit here, this is stay in a kind of line here now. With some width, but it's a kind of line depending on the potential you have. So the spread is very small here, about many potential. So this is a correlation well known as Phillips line. So this line represents the correlation between the calculated values of the triton binding energy and the uh, neutron deuteron doublet scattering length. So it's due to the fact that the binding energy of both triton and deuteron, as well as the energy eigenvalues of the two nucleons, singlet virtual state, are all small, too small in the energy scale of the nuclear force. 
So Tion line is another uh, correlation between the triton binding energy and the alpha particle binding. A theoretical explanation for this phenomenon is given also after by Pern and Kern, but that's another low energy correlation that shows a kind of line also between the triton binding and the alpha particle binding, the three and four body. And Quester line also, we have uh, done some work on that. Né? It's considering that uh, for any given two-body Hamiltonian, there exists a large class of unitary equivalent Hamiltonians that lead to the same scattering, a scattering phase shift at all energy. They have studied the saturation curves at the reasonable equivalent potential. The binding energy per particle changed by several MeV in either direction, and the saturation minimum shifts to higher or lower density as the binding increases or decreases. So these uh, are from nuclear physics, correlation quite well known already. I'm going to talk now about more mass imbalance, the body near unitarity. These are properties of the uh, one case of the hollow nuclear. We study more hollow nuclear, but I'm talking about this because this we can directly extend for alpha alpha beta in general, if, we, uh, if not bound this uh, identical system. These are the, what we have, the, the kind of hollow nuclear, né? is two neutrons far away from the a core. A core is a more compact object, bound state here. So we describe better this in a kind of system where we have the core more compact, né? closed shell, for example, and after you have two neutrons far apart. Né? This three body system has large two body scattering length in comparison with the range of the interaction. Suggests the three body energy are f states. The experimental discovery of exotic nucleus, such as helium, 6, lithium, 11, beryllium, 14, far from the stability range, predicted by traditional models as the liquid provide a new kind of phenomenon observed in nuclear physics to search universal uh, effects, uh, the body effect. Use of the cross section of nucleus in classical radio uh, is proportional to uh, the mass number to the power one divided by three. So approximately 1.2 times this factor. As an example, if you consider uniform distribution mass of lithium 11, one should expect around 2.7 Fermi, the size. However, it was verified experimentally that it is around from 6 to 8 Fermi, which is near the radius of the lead. So we, there are two old eight lead now. As the lithium level decay in lithium 9, the system of two nails weakly bound to a core became, I think that was the first fox, for example, to look for a female effect in hollow nucleus. In fact, from the known two and three body observables, oh, sorry, by the energy and corresponding scattering lane, no female excited state were found for this particular system, which is a Borromian system body bound system for which no two body subsystem uh, are bound. These are the first studies that were done in this direction of hollow nucleus, where they considered also lithium 11 and also carbon that by Fedorov, Jensen, and so on, and Das Gupta. So they are looking at that time for carbon uh, 20 and carbon 19 as possible now, because. Uh, there was promising we have the nuclear like carbon 17 and carbon 9 that have neutron separation energy around 729 and 160 keV respectively. So I expect to have a low line one half state. The moving state might then appear just below, as they say at that time. So that was some final of first study. So these are the kind of four possibilities that we have for the body system. With, uh, when we have two identical particles. Two identical particles, the hollow nuclear can be described like this one if, because usually uh, neutron neutron are not bound. So we call Samba, this in contraposition of this uh, guy here, the Robichaud, that was studying a system that have two identical particles that bound and not bound with a third particle. He called this Tango, né? so we call this Samba. But we can also have a system of uh, more general. In atomic, we can have all these four possibilities. The Borromian, when there is no bound, 
in, in all these three uh, terms, you know, all are virtual state, you know, and these are all bound. The interest is that the size of weakly bound with two particle are found uh, are function of few physical scale. Okay? For a given three body binding energy, the most compact system is the Borromian one. Here, single pairs are unbound, while the all bound, all single particles form bound state is the largest one. Of course, this is considering that the three body binding is fixed, the same for both. The, this slide, I think, to be as already shown, is, I think, the system that I, I was from Bertolani here, that was uh, Borromian system. Like helium here, when there is no particles below here, they form a kind of Borromian. So you have a core not bound with the neutron, and the two neutrons are unbound also, but the three parts are bound. So if you broke one of them, it becomes completely unbound. <laughs> That's the Borromian, Borromian rings. No? Here is what I'm just pointing at, just one of the first papers that we, do, we did on this direction with hollow nuclei, because we have tried to look for the, uh, for the FIMOV conditions with, uh, uh, with neutron, neutron, and core system, just varying height. But of course, this is valid for any kind of system in general, because here is the two body interaction of the two identical particles. This is two body interaction of the non-identical, neutron core, divided by one three body scale that we can put the ground state, for example, first the line and so on. Huh? So, and uh, you can uh, look for the position of the particles inside this. Really, this carbon 20 is a bit far, I think, it's not inside after it's realized. No? Huh? But so the two bodies, are here, this side here are all bound, this quadrant here. This quadrant here is samba because these are the positions where you have the neutron neutron core. And these are the, the Borromian ca case, and these are the tang case this side. And that was extended after to atomic system no? that we did here, because the atomic is much easier to find out system like three body uh, identical. We have the helium uh, three no? here. No? that now we know that the first excited state is an FMOV state né? that we are looking for a long time. Né? And here are points that we have point here in some study that, we, that I'm going also to talk a bit more after. Okay? And these lines uh, correspond to the mass ratio that we have. Okay? Mass, uh, larger mass ratio here is this. These are the thresholds that we have. These are the threshold conditions in a scaling function where this, this was the same that I sh shown before, but this is the scaling that we have the, uh, the three body state. As you see here, the Z here is that E3N plus one divided by the E3N. The way that it puts is the inverse of this 515 that I have, when I have E2 equals zero, in this case, the, the center. Now. So all the FMOV state, they fall in the same line because of this scaling. So we can compact this in just one line. And this gives 0 0.044, the inverse of this, take the square root. No? And these are the ratios. So we can call this as a function, a general function of the two body binding energies and the mass ratio. The mass ratio gives the M beta divided by the the two particles that are identical, the mass of the two particles. So, two, uh, two levels of three body spec are related by a scaling factor. This is scaling factor, where S0 is a constant which varies according to the mass ratio. And this is the, the, the function that we have. No? The mass half of the identical particle but divided by the other particles here. Okay? Yeah. And here uh, you have when the mass of the alpha is larger, this side, and that's smaller. So the maximum is that 22.7 because we take the square root of that, no? for the 550, for identical mass. For MF equals 100 in beta, you have 2.17. When M alpha is much larger than M beta, have particular interest in cold atoms. No? And this is the same that we have published before, but directly in terms of the energies, not the square root, no? that we can find also this, the same, uh, same kind of plot no? that was published in 99. 
in a paper that we have with the student, also Tobias and Delfino. So to improve our understanding on the universal aspect of field body system, we have two uh, uh, recent uh, works of our group that was detailed more uh, by Tobias in this talk. One talk about limit site for unbalanced mass, and another uh, improving the primary scaling function with Monte Carlo approach with two and three body interaction. I'm going to just uh, remind here the abstract that we have for that in here, the limit cycle in the spectra of mass imbalance, many Boswell system, the independence between uh, few body scales beyond the Van der Waals universality is demonstrated for the extreme mass imbalanced case of a specific many Boson system. This finds generalized the scaling properties of universal tetramers to a broader class of homogeneous uh, few body systems. Uh, we assume two heavy atoms interact with n minus two lighter ones at unitary limit, uh, using a particular case where no interactions are active between identical particles. By inspecting, investigating the interwoven spectra of this many body system for an arbitrary number of light bosons. So a large mass ratio between the particles allows us to treat this N body system analytically in this using uh, an uh, analytical approximation by solving an effective inverse square long range interaction which is established for the two heavy bosons for a class N minus two light bosons. So, okay. So this will take some approximation also some bond of bond of approximation. And that quantum Monte Carlo also we study a primary scaling function with microscopic two and three body interaction. We study more now the phase primary scaling function. We present an energy scaling function to predict in a specific range the energy of bosonic trimers with large scattering lengths and finite range uh, interaction, which is validated by quantum Monte Carlo calculation using uh, microscopic Hamiltonian with two and three body potential. So we propose a scaling function depending on the scattering length, effective range, and the resonant uh, reference energy, which we choose as the time energy at unitarity. As I'm not uh, presenting this here, here, one can look more details during the transparency of the Tobias, that Tobias gave a bit more details on that, no? on this case. So let me start now with the part more the scattering near the unitarity. So model study with uh, for mass imbalance with weakly bound nuclear and atomic three body system. We have first the case that we have uh, a neutral, for example, that's a study that we did before, uh, elastic scattering with neutral and carbon 19. Uh, elastic scattering near the carbon 20 uh, critical condition. This study can be transferred directly to an atom dimer collision in which a light atom is colliding with a, a light heavy dimer for exact correspondence when no bound state exists between the two light particles. No? Heavy atom collision in a heavy light time near the unitarity, the motivation for such a study with weakly bound dimer are that strong mass ratio allows a born open diamond approximation that we can compare with exact calculation by Fadiev calculation. A mass asymmetry effect in the scattering you observe near the FMOV limit also. This study can be relevant in the analysis of processes which occur in low density systems as in ultra cold atomic condensates. Therefore, the main focus are S wave observable, so very low energy, such as the scattering observer, it will be like a phase shift and the energy, the moment associated with the colliding energy, the K, and delta zero, the scattering uh, phase shift with the associated cross section. The effect of range in K cot delta can be verified with zero range and finite range uh, two body interaction. The pole position of this K cot delta are studied as function of the dimer bound states. So 
So, okay, scattering. So, uh, I'm going to just give something, I think, quantum mechanics about scattering. So, but first I can introduce that about the scatter scattering phenomena, some basics. Né? So, since uh, Rutherford discovery of nucleus, né, almost everything we know about nuclear, atomic, and subatomic parts have been discovered by scattering experiments. Né? In low energy physics, scattering phenomena provide the standard tool to explore patterns in solid state system. In ultra cold atomic physics, as in, in both ice condensate, we have dilute system in which scattering phenomena can happen at very, very low energy between weakly bound few body structures. So what's interesting for us more is weakly bound system. But in any way, I'm going to give some, uh, a picture about in some general uh, consideration about this uh, scattering case, né? just to remember some definitions that are in textbooks. Né? So low energy. Low energy scattering are methods are the partial waves in general. High energy scattering, you take more born approximation series expansion. So consider an, an idealized experiment with a beam of particles A and a given momentum K being scattered by a, a target B. There's uh, where A and B can have some structure. As a result of the collision, we have elastic process where the energy and, and, and number of particles are conserved. In elastic process, when we change the condition of the field, it can broke or can become excited, one of them, or absorption, when the two compact and we have just one system at the end. So the scattering phenomena are characterized by differential cross-section, from where we obtain the total cross-section. Consider a collision experiment in which the detector measures the number of particles per unit of time, and delta omega here, the, the, the angles, né? scatter into an uh, element of angle solid, defined by theta and phi. This number is proportional to the incident flux, the number of parts per unit of time crossing the uh, unit of area normal to the surface, to the incident. So the difference cross section is defined as the ratio of the number of particles scattered into that direction per unit time, per unit of solid angle, divided by the incident flux. That's the give the that's something that I say that you can find also in textbook. The total cross-section just takes the integral of that. No? And for the cross-section, we have dimension of area and can be uh, separated into elastic, inelastic, absorption, or total. That is a picture that we can find also about our, this collision, because you take that all particles have the same energy, mostly that to, to calculate this with Schrodinger equation, eh? represented by the wave pack we obtain the probability amplitude of outgoing waves from the time-dependent Schrodinger equation there. But, but we can apply stationary conditions if the beam is switched on for times enough long compared with the encounter time. With the wave pack, in that case, you take this energy here by this transformation, and that's the equation that we have the Schrodinger equation for a two-body system. So in 3D, we consider a plane wave incident on localized target. Outside the localized target region, the wave function is a combination of incident plane wave and scattered spherical wave. With VR isotropic, short range, the scattering wave function is given by this form here, where this corresponds to the scattered part here. In the, where delta is the phase shift. So this is spreading here in the other direction. And these are the polynomial of Legendre polynomial. That's the usual one. With the wave function defined in this way, more approximately, the scattered part is given by the amplitude. It's F, L. F theta is up here, and here I expand in partial waves in terms of a momentum here. No? Okay. So you have this from, we obtain the partial wave scattering amplitude with the associated phase shifts. No? So that's given by that expression here. No? This is the usual that sometimes appears a quarter delta also here, and because you just have to transform this exponential here. The particle associated with the uh, wave function is given by energy of the incoming particles, given by this energy, and the flux is given by J here, and uh, you can take that wave function that showed before here, and you have this main part here, and also this is scattered part, no? that we have scattering amplitude. The flux crossing the area 
Yeah, defined by the Sol Young, so is given by this term here. So you have the area and there you have the F tet of what, uh, this term here. So from that we obtain the differential cross section in terms of this amplitude squared. Okay, and here you can have this uh, the you can take this total cross-section now after the integration there in terms of this uh, uh, phase shifts né? and you can separate in partial waves of that. So after you can take also the main ones that are convenient in your uh, calculation. Né? Usually we take the lower one. Né? So these are known in books, also the optical theorem that you can take directly by the, just taking theta equals zero here. Né? Okay. Uh, so for the early partial wave cross-section is maximized when the cotangent of delta is equal to zero. Né? Because I can write that uh, each term here, that I here, in this form here. Né? One plus cot square of delta. Né? So in this case, with this uh, delta L equal to 2n plus 1 pi by 2, the cross-section uh, exhibits a narrow peak as a function of the energy characterizing a resonance with the corresponding energy given by the energy of the resonance. So near the resonance, we can express the Scott del Cotton delta in this way. Né? That's the point of the resonance when it's zero, this term here, né? when E equal to R. And gamma here is defined as the width of the resonance. Probably you've seen already this picture in many places already. This is the uh, one corresponding, the Wigner bright Wigner formula for that also. Né? Varying slowly with the energy in the, in the vicinity of the resonance. Né? So the parameter gamma is associated with a typical lifetime of the metastable bound state formed in the potential. Oh, here I just represent novamente again the cross-section in case of flashback resonance where we have applied this to calculate. Né? Resonance scattering phenomenon, exploring ultra cold atomic gases. Né? Alkyl atoms interact for short range van der Waals interaction, and you can control here by magnetic field here the position of this resonance. Né? So, in that case, you can control the two body pain. And here I have just some basic about the uh, Lippmann Schwinger equation uh, that we have. Né? It's just the same as Schrodinger equation that we have more convenient to calculate for the scattering system né? to write in this way. Né? Uh, we have positive energy, and here we have the potential written in this way. We can write the Schrodinger equation in this form with a general solution given by that form here, where this uh, function here is the, oh, when it equals zero, apply for the operator here. Né? And when applied this operator to the green function here, it's given a delta, direct delta. Né? So the general solution is given by this form here. Né? So far from the scattering center, uh, with the k prime and k radial here part, considering that uh, this expansion here, né, with this amplitude of scattering, it can be defined in this form here. The scattering amplitude can be defined as a momentum element here, né, between where U is the potential. Okay. So in terms of the original interaction, the transition matrix is given by this form. Okay. So we can write the differential cross-section in this uh, general form, yeah, in terms of the transition matrix. No? With the mass here, because you have calculated the two-body system there. Okay. So for three-body system, the unbalanced case, the pole, the k cot delta for the halo nucleon, uh, considering the scattering of a neutron by the two-body subsystem, was studied in a, uh, here I think it's carbon 19, I guess, no? was studied in a few papers by our group by extending some previous approach used in neutron-deutron. The basic approach is by the three-body Fadier formalism, which is an extension of the two-body Lippmann-Schwinger equation, uh, couple of equations in general. No? In this case, we need to consider the uh, identical particles and the non-identical particles to body interaction, such that the corresponding virtual 
and bound state, energies can be well reproduced. So we have two kinds of two-body transition matrix for the, these two subsystems in a couple system. These are more detailed formalized here in this two papers, there's a three papers that we have here related on that. Né? The formalism was later extended to atomic system. In that case, we can call all the bound state also. These are some, something more basic here, maybe if I have time here. The amplitude of the ohm shell scattering. These are also extracted from one of the papers where we compact this as a kind of two-body system for the three-body system. The amplitude of one shell scattering of N and NC target in moment space is related to the separable potential spectator function that we call TN here. Né? So here is the fit with this HN here that's uh, extracted from the wave function there. So being given by the following two-body kind of integral equation. That looks like a two-body in that case, but this term here is have all the interaction. Né? It's given here below. So key is the moment of the spectator particle N with respect to the center of mass of the NC subsystem. The on shell energy K equal uh, elastic here, E equal L, uh, final here, is given by this term here, and this is the energy of the NC, where A is the mass ratio, and we are using uh, these units, né? the mass equal one of them and H bar also equal one, just for convenience. The effective, inter oh, sorry. So the effective interaction in the above integral is given by that form with this kernel two and kernel one that can be detailed out with this gamma hen hen, okay? with this tau n hen is the predator here for the two body subsystem that we have NC and NN. So that for uh, NN and then C, uh, two bodies interaction, we use one term separable Yamaguchi potential, where lambda is this one here, and the range of the interaction is given by R0 here. But we can also use a zero range interaction. In case of zero range, this is one, this term here, you take just lambda, and after you have just to present uh, uh, but we have used maybe Yamaguchi type potential to see also the effect of the range. Né? So here are basically reproduced from that uh, paper that I mentioned before. What is the this uh, matrix that we have, these two body, related to the two body T matrix? Né? We have tau NC and tau NN. These are some convenience that we have this symbol there né? in the way that was defined in that paper. Né? And these are the two and three body uh, related energies here. KNN, kappa NC, kappa TNN, and so on. Okay. Not bother much with this. And these are the K1 and K2 functions that appear in that uh, uh, effective potential that I can say, that V. Né? Because you can see here, né? this K here, K1 and K2 here. Okay. Okay. So, handling the singularity in case of zero range by a subtraction generalization approach. This is only necessary when I'm not using the Yamaguchi interaction because when I use zero range, uh, this diversion at the original. So, I have to regularize and renormalize the theory. For that case, I think uh, Tobias, I think, gave all the cement about how it's been done this then. Because we made this uh, a subtraction just to regularize. There are other people that, uh, in the old time also, we used to do that. We used to regularize with some lambda here, né? just. Né? But in that case, we regularize with some parameter in this part. This is written exactly as we used to write this two-body uh, T matrix also in the same way. Né? So we take a, a resolvent, I can say, for the T matrix in that form, né? and after, we take some subtraction here. In that case, we take the subtraction exactly as p equal k2, such that you don't need this uh, uh, imaginary term in this term here, because it's appearing here. So it's canceling. No? And this hn is given by the solution, the numerical solution of this, 
and divide by this term. That gives completely the amplitude. Don't share the scattering length. Uh, scattering amplitude is given by this Hn, okay, where the k cot delta, now I can write in this way, in terms of this gamma. So the cross-section, differential cross-section, now as the square of this uh, Hn. So calculation of bound and virtual states is just an extension now, for if I go to virtual state also. Now. I have just to extend this formalism. So we have this H and C, H and N for bound states here, but by going to the second sheet of the complex energy plane, I just have to add some term here to reach the virtual state. So that's better to go more <laughs> slowly and, and study interesting, can go more in detail in, the, in, in what we wrote before also. Or in the papers, or even in the transparency, they can try to recheck this thing. So the resume that we have for the case of uh, N carbon 19 is this. The low energy of the elastic S wave scattering for the neutron carbon 19 are established near the critical condition to occur an excited film of state. The results for the S wave scattering amplitude present universal scaling features with the variation of the carbon 19 binding energy for fixed carbon-20 and neutron-neutron singlet virtual state energy. This ratio here obtained for finite range potential changing from uh, 0 0.44 to 0 0.45 are close to a universal factor found also, the one can found in the physical report by Humber and uh, this value 4.419. So what we found is very close. So the excited three body carbon 20 state turns into a virtual state for a large carbon 19 binding. The threshold moves from 167 keV to 190 keV when the effective ranges are increased to reasonable physical values. Okay, maybe. Maybe I stop here, I think. Oh, let me see. Yeah. After I can continue the next lecture from this point yeah, yeah, in front again. Okay. If there is, for me, uh, this first lecture, okay, if there is some doubt, then I can. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura, for the lecture. Questions? Thank you for the lecture. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. So if I it correctly, when you are not uh, uh, in the unitary and the or zero range limit, the three body can have resonances and virtual state. Yeah. But in the unitary limit, we see the FMO of the tower of states. Yeah. So this is, uh, we talk about bound state usually, I talk here. But of course, you can see some trace of this in the resonance region. Yeah, this was my question. Yeah. So is this tower of states uh, completely destroyed? Uh, or there is a reson multiple resonances that... Uh, uh, that you are asking is something that I think experimental. We expect some, uh, uh, some trace, but depends how, how close you are from the unitarity. Because if you are in the unitarity, you expect this level of curve. Né? But even in the unitarity, as we know from experimental, it's not so easy to reach that. Né? So in the resonance, they have to, to point out exactly that uh, really this is related to some extension that we are going a bit far from the unitarity né, to see this resonance. Because as I showed, when they discovered this, it came from a resonance state. Né? So in the left side, uh, in the picture that I showed. Né? Okay. And after uh, they come back, uh, it, so the resonance it becomes bound. Okay. Yeah. So probably there is already the trace. Maybe I can talk yeah. to yeah. Thank, okay. thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I actually have a question. I don't know if I can. Okay. So uh, I have another question. Uh, can you go back to the uh, tango system, uh, to the slide uh, with the tango and the samba system, uh -huh. the three body? So in that case, if I understood correctly, all the particles are interacting close to unitarity, just some are, have, don't have a two-body bound, and some other have. Uh -huh. 
something like that. That's what. Yeah, well, we are only uh, thinking about uh, this uh, unitary or near unitary limit. I can say. No? And then I was thinking about this system in which you have uh, one very massive uh, particle and then uh, two light one. And mm. you say that you can use a born open uh, approximation. I so think the other way, I think maybe if I did that, uh, I think when we have two heavy and one light, See? you can use born open approximation easily. Because this was done already by Fonseca, Redsch, and. Uh, and okay. But in this case, using the born oppenheimer approximation, is still possible to see signature of uh, Thomas collapse, for example? Because at that point, you will have uh, uh, particles that are fixed, and they cannot uh, really um, uh, collapse. I don't know if I understood correctly. Because, uh, you, you, because Thomas collapse uh, is just uh, you can see from the original equation directly, you know, but uh, can you repeat the question? <laughs> because I, yeah, uh, well, let me see what Probably this is quite technical, and maybe yeah. we want to yeah. discuss it uh, with more yeah. calm. But I was thinking if uh, using born up uh, born, uh, With born up in approximation, see, because born up in approximation, this system you can show that it gives a, an effective interaction one by r square for three ah. particles. That's the. So it's really, in fact, is as, as a two body, the third body is like a two body, but with one by r square, and this gives the, the number, uh, infinite number of levels. No? Okay, I think yeah. I understood, but uh, yeah. I have to think about and that. that uh, okay, and that we have extend also this uh, for the any particles light ones after, <laughs> as I just show in one paper that I just present just abstract there for me that one. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Any more questions? I do have one, Laura, okay. which is when people are talking about uh, helium trimers, mm -hmm. uh, they say that the excited state is an FMOV state, which sounds weird to me. The ground state, it's not. The ground state is far from... Uh on that region, but uh, you, I think already is is giving this relation with the uh, ground. And, uh, but uh, really, what we say, the FM of state are the excited level, no? because sometimes we have very deep state that is a uh, ground state. No, so, but uh, and are there more states experimenting? It should, uh, in principle, should have, no? but, but they are difficult mm -hmm. to observe. I but I don't know, uh, but not measure till now. Mm -hmm. But of course, to be clear, that the really FMOV, I think you can write uh, that experimental is better to get in that uh, same ratio another one. But the, this, the difference of energy is quite large now. Mm -hmm. It's 515. Okay? So, may, so why we are talking about uh, strong mass uh, imbalance system also now? Mm -hmm. Because in this is equal mass, mm -hmm. 3 helium. Mm -hmm. Equal mass, into, we'll see, have a 515 difference. They should uh, find out another one <laughs> if they have uh, very precise equipment to, to nice. measure this. Nice. But that takes a long time also for them to, find, to realize this. No? Mm -hmm. yeah. These were predicted by Glockland. Glockland, Delphine also. Was, uh, no, Delphine no, it was uh, Cornelis and Glockland. And Delphine also have worked with Glockland for some time. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, let's thank Laura again. Thank you, Good morning, everyone. So we have today the third and the last lecture from Professor Caldera, 
that uh, written there, uh, about experimental uh, applications and um, superconducting qubits. Professor Caldera, thank you very much. You can start now, please. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning. And let's start my uh, last lecture. And so, um, as I promised you, uh, what I'm going to do in this last lecture is to present some sort of experimental realizations of everything I've been uh, telling you about, and at least part of it. Uh, and uh, I will also try to uh, address the issue of uh, some sort of uh, practical applica applications, such as qubits, for instance. And uh, so uh, the first example I want to give you, uh, I don't know whether you remember that uh, the current bias, Josephson Junction, uh, was uh, the sort of device that we uh, had Cooper pairing from one side to the other, and we could have uh, current being transported without any sort of uh, voltage between the terminals of this junction. And uh, so, uh, but if you just try to uh, drive the system very close to the instability, because there is instability, a critical current uh, above which, what we have is a sort of development of a voltage state. And uh, I explained that in terms of tunneling of uh, fluxoid lines and things like that. And But basically, uh, the mechanical analog will be something like this. The system, the system is sitting here, so there is a sort of different of phase between uh, the wave functions at the terminals of the junction. And uh, then it adjusts itself in such a way that we can transport current without the uh, appearance of a voltage. But then, when you reach this uh, critical current, of course, you know, uh, this washboard potential, this barrier here will uh, become zero, and then we can just roll downwards with this, uh, this sort of a fictitious, uh, fictitious particle. And then that's the, uh, this running state is the voltage state. But then we can drive the system very, very close to this uh, critical current and wait long enough for this uh, transition to take place. And that can take place in two ways, either by uh, thermal fluctuation. So if you still have some, uh, enough, if you still have enough temperature for the system to be uh, thermally activated over the barrier, that's one possibility. And the other one is when we are at very, very low temperatures, we can tunnel. So uh, these uh, fluxoids will tunnel through the, uh, the, the junction and then we'll have the, uh, the appearance of the voltage state. And I showed you, for instance, that uh, if we try to plot this log gamma minus one, all that uh, minus one, so that's called the uh, scape temperature here, we can show that uh, that's the sort of picture that we had before. I showed you that uh, for very high temperatures, what we have is the Arrhenius sort of behavior. And then uh, when you reach a crossover temperature, start to lower the temperature, then we'll have the uh, flattening of this uh, curve. So, uh, and that's a signature, a clear one, that there is some sort of transition taking place, and that's not thermal at all. So uh, then we will have quantum tunneling of these lines. So uh, that's the, uh, I think that was the first really uh, reliable uh, experimental evidence of the, uh, of the tunneling of fluxoids, for instance. Namely, uh, so we can just jump from one uh, state, current state, to a voltage state in this case. So uh, that, that's the picture here. So we have this uh, experimental setup with copper, gold, niobium uh, superconducting uh, uh, material, and then we can build a junction and we can just uh, try to... Uh, change the external current in such a way that we drive the system very close to the instability, wait long enough, and then we can plot this, uh, the inverse of this uh, rate, log of that, and the inverse of the whole thing. And that's the picture that we had, and that was exactly what we, uh, we were expecting from theory. So, uh, and then another thing is that uh, that's the escape temperature for the uh, infinite quality factor. Infinite quality factor means that uh, we don't have any sort of dissipation in our in our system. 
So uh, as we start to uh, turn on dissipation, so what happens is that this flattening will take place at lower and lower temperatures in such a way that if we had a sort of uh, completely classical system with no possibility of quantum mechanical tunneling, this sort of a Arrhenius behavior would prevail down to zero temperature. So uh, that's the first experimental evidence I wanted to tell you about. The second one, okay, the second one is here, is uh, now I'm, I'm going to address the problem of the speed ring. So uh, as I showed you, remember that we can uh, turn the external flux through the uh, through a superconducting ring closed by a Josephson junction. And uh, so we, we can test, for instance, decay of metastable stable states, coherent tunneling between the two degenerate states, or the energy levels of these systems. And uh, in this case here, there is a sort of evidence of level crossing. So uh, if we just sit here, for instance, and uh, have another degenerate state on the other side, we know that uh, we can make linear combinations of right and left states, and then we can split these two very close to the uh, crossing of these two levels. And uh, one uh, real, uh, possibility that we have here is to uh, measure, for instance, directly the oscillation from one side of the barrier to the other. But we can also try to, uh, dis to measure, for instance, these sort of uh, splitting between the uh, two levels. And that's exactly what these guys do here. Uh, they have this indirect evidence for the uh, tunneling from one side of the barrier to the other through the uh, appearance of this uh, splitting between uh, two degenerate levels, one on the uh, right-hand side and the other one on the left-hand side of the barrier. So uh, what we have here then is the squid ring and we bias the squid rings with some sort of a microwave. The microwave is in, almost in resonance with this splitting between uh, these levels here. And then what we show is that uh, what these guys were able to show, the, the reference up here, uh, is that uh, once we start to change, we can change the, uh, the whole structure in two ways. We can change the external flux and also the, uh, the barrier. I will show you a, a bit later how we can do that. If you replace one junction by a couple of junctions and then we have one uh, flux that we can use to uh, tune the height of the barrier itself. And uh, so in this case, we can really uh, see the transition between uh, these two levels, one on the uh, right-hand side and the other one on the left-hand side. And uh, we can show that and we can see uh, what happens as we uh, start to go close to the, uh, the crossing and then uh, we, uh, we pass it. So uh, the thing is that we start, we have a minimum of this uh, splitting of energy. So that's a sort of indirect evidence that uh, we, it's not indirect, it's direct in terms of the energy levels of the, uh, of the squid. But now uh, what is the, uh, what will be the, the, the uh, uh, the consequence of this uh, splitting is exactly the uh, coherent tunneling from one side to the other. So that's what uh, another clear experimental evidence of the uh, quantum mechanical structure of levels in the sort of uh, superconducting device. And the other one here, again, let's go back to the squid, but now it's a direct evidence of the uh, tunneling from one side to the other. We can, for instance, think of the squid in a bistable potential. We can tune the external flux in such a way that we have this bistable potential. And now, as I showed you, we can really uh, make, map this system into the spin boson Hamiltonian. So we're talking about these uh, two lowest line states, for instance, and uh, so it behaves like a spin, a spin in a field, in an external field. And uh, so uh, I described, for instance, coherent oscillations from one side of the barrier to the other, like the spin from one 
configuration, up configuration to the down configuration, once we have one external field pointing along the x direction. Namely, this external field means actually uh, the, pro the probability of tunneling from one side to the other side of the barrier. Now, what we can do then is uh, what we have is exactly something like uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. It's a spin subject to one fixed uh, field, and then we can also uh, apply a time-dependent field. And then we have some sort of a resonance uh, behavior in, to, to be studied in this system. And uh, so, in this case, what we have is a sort of Rabi oscillations. And these Rabi oscillations, they are exactly the what happens when we start to uh, change this uh, relative minimum between one side and the other through a, a field perpendicular to the external field that we uh, that is represented by the tunneling probability here. And uh, so in this case, we can measure these uh, Rabi oscillations for different intensities of these external oscillating fields. And then we can easily see that, uh, so this sort of Rabi oscillation is a clear evidence that something is really processing in a sort of uh, NMR experiment. So in this case, the precession means that uh, this fictitious particle is jumping from one side to the other coherently. So that's what the uh, precession is all about if we try to uh, bring the idea of NMR to the uh, coherent oscillation of a squid ring. ring. Right, okay. So uh, then we see that uh, we are, all these Rabi oscillations, they are a clear evidence that what we see is a uh, coherent oscillation from one side to the other. Moreover, we have the uh, damping here. So uh, it's not, with, this oscillation is not a fixed amplitude. I showed you last time that uh, due to damping, because my uh, two-state system is coupled to a bath of oscillators. And these bath of oscillators provide us with some sort of uh, damping for this, uh, or destruction, in this case, destruction of coherence. So, uh, so we have the coherence of this oscillation from one side to the other, but then it's quite long lived in this case here. So we are in a regime where we have very, very low damping in the classical equation of motion. So that's what happens here. And we can also perform Ramsey interference if we put two uh, pi divided by two pulses here. So we can make something completely analogous to the uh, NMR experiment. We can measure Ramsey interference and also spin echo. So, uh, and all those, they are in perfect agreement with the fact that uh, something must be coherently uh, hopping from one side to the other of the barrier. So that's a clear evidence of some sort of quantum mechanical, the coherent tunneling between one configuration and the other one. And as I said, that's a clear evidence of uh, one state of current to one direction and the state the other direction. So we have tunneling of these two macroscopic states. Mind you, these states, they, they involve one flux of quantum, one flux of quantum from one configuration to the other. And that means 10 to the 10th ball magnetons. So it's quite huge. Uh, now, uh, I also give you many examples of uh, bulk superconductors. So some sort of a superconducting uh, cylinder or film. And then we, uh, we, we've been discussing vort vortices in these superconductors too. And uh, in particular, these high, these uh, type two superconductors. These type two superconductors, I, I can have the penetration of many of these uh, uh, flux tubes forming vortex states. And uh, they are organized in this sort of uh, abricosov lattice. And uh, I was discussing with you uh, a couple of days ago about the uh, competition between two lengths, right? One length is the uh, penetration depth of the uh, magnetic field, and the other one is the coherence length for the uh, superconductor. Namely, uh, the distance that the electromagnetic field penetrates the superconductor and 
the uh, size of the Cooper pair, so to speak. And uh, so in this case, high C superconductors, they are extremely type two superconductors. So we can really think of these vortex lines are very, very tiny, very narrow filaments. And uh, so we have many of those just uh, moving around or they are pinned will be uh, quite interested in the uh, regime where they are strongly pinned or they can flow. I will discuss that next. That next. Uh, so, uh, and the other thing is that uh, quantum mechanical fluctuations can be very important in these systems here. And the second thing is that vortex motion that will generate dissipation. So uh, we have some sort of finite resistivity driven by the possibility of uh, the pinning vortices around the system. So uh, if these vortices are the pin, so if you can have motion of vortices, we will induce some sort of uh, dissipative motion. And that, of course, we know uh, will be measured by some sort of finite resistivity in our system. So uh, that's uh, one of the things that uh, was behind everything I uh, told you a couple of days ago. So uh, the thing now is, uh, let's see uh, how we can pin vortex lines, in particular in superconductors that we have these uh, copper oxide planes. Then we can have, first of all, impurities. And then the vortex lines, they can penetrate, right? And they are not very uniform, but they, you know, just, uh, it's a distorted line. And uh, so we have many of those. So we can have this sort of lattice, but this lattice is uh, it's composed of distorted uh, lines. And uh, that's one possibility because of impurities. The other one is uh, intrinsically pin vortices. And these ones are vortices that, uh, since I have these planes, I can have vortices just uh, in between two of those, between two parallel planes. So I can also have the pinning due to this uh, plane existence, basically. So I can provide some sort of uh, potential barrier for the vortices due to the uh, presence of planes. And I can also irradiate my material with ions, and then you have a column of ions. And of course, these are impurities, but not scattered impurities, but some sort of very uh, well-behaved geometry of impurities in this case. So I have these columnar defects. And these are the kind of vortices we can have in, uh, in our system. And usually they are pinned. And uh, another thing that I showed you uh, two days ago was that uh, the dynamics of these, uh, the transverse displacement of the uh, vortex line is uh, governed by the question of this kind here. So that's something that plays the role of the uh, mass time acceleration or the inertial term in the uh, point particle dynamics. So there is also the damping, right? And the derivative of a conservative potential. So the and this uh, Nabla square of phi, phi here is uh, representing these uh, uh, transverse displacement. So, and this guy, this uh, number square, represents my uh, elastic energy. So that, that's, that's the uh, equation that governs the dynamics of vortex lines. And as I told you before, we have some sort of U that is basically due to impurities, for instance, or defects, and uh, then we have this sort of uh, external potential. And we can also impose some sort of a flow of the uh, charged superfluid, namely the uh, superconducting ground state. So we can have currents going through and uh, then we can distort this potential. So uh, my lines, they are in a sort of uh, metastable uh, configurations. And uh, so if I reach a critical value, they can just uh, release these uh, minimum of energy and run through the system, causing a sort of um, dissipative motion. 
And uh, actually, uh, it's nice to see, uh, for instance, the uh, levitating materials. For instance, we have some sort of uh, superconducting uh, sample here, maintained at very, very low temperatures, and we have a magnet. And then we have the distortion of these lines entering the uh, superconductor. So if I can make sure that these are strongly pinned, that's all I want to have levitating trains, for instance, right? So if they are not uh, very strongly pinned, what, I, I, what we have is that this magnet will just uh, be in a sort of very unstable situation. So uh, these lines can move around. So in this way, my uh, magnet would be uh, moving around. So in order to have a good levitating uh, coin or uh, something huge like a train, but we need is some sort of very strong bidding. Now, so energetically, uh, what is going on here? What we have is the sort of uh, washboard potential in more than one dimension. So I have a one extended washboard in one dimension, like a roof that we have in our houses. And uh, so then we have a sort of elastic string just lying on this uh, roof. And uh, so this line, you know, it's about one, one of the minimum, but then it's a bit tilted. And uh, depending on what, so I can take part of the line and bring part of the line to the other minimum and gain some energy. And uh, then there is a competition of the sort of uh, energy I gain just bringing part of the line to the other minimum compared to the distortion line here, distortion energy here and there. So I create two walls, wall and anti-wall. And uh, these are distorted uh, configurations. So they have elastic energy stored there, and that's positive. And on the other hand, I have this filtered configuration. So a part of the line has already uh, acquired more negative energy, so to speak. So in this way, there is a competition between uh, the size of the line that I transport to the other side and the uh, distortion energy of the wall. So uh, in this way, what I can have, depending on the size of the line, we can nucleate the more stable phase. So I bring part of the line to the other side, and then depending on the size I can bring the whole system to the uh, new configuration, which has less energy than the former one. And uh, so fine. And this sort of uh, transition can take place in two ways. You can either have some sort of uh, thermal fluctuation to hop over the barrier. I mean, a finite size of the line. Or it can go to mechanical tunnel. Right? So uh, there are two ways to see that. And that's exactly what happens to the point particle too. But the point particle is only a point particle. It either jumps over the uh, barrier or it tunnels. In this case here, we have to take more into account, namely uh, the size of this uh, part of the line. So there is a critical size. If, I, if I'm able to nucleate the critical size what happens is that uh, the system will just go to the, uh, the other minimum. And uh, so it can take place in many steps. So once I have distorted this potential seen by the lines, by the, the uh, vortex states, what happens is that uh, we can have things like flux flow. For instance, if I reach critical value, all these lines, they can freely uh, flow through the uh, material, and then I'll have a very high resistance. Or we can have some sort of so-called flux creep. Because in, in this case here, I sh I'm showing you a very well-behaved washboard. But sometimes, due to the impurities, what I have is a sort of very uh, 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 not, not, not very uniform line but a completely distorted one. And uh, so if I have this completely distorted line, it can have one configuration here and another 
neighboring one, which is more stable. So uh, we can have this sort of uh, creeping from one configuration to the other in this very uh, disordered potential. And the motion won't be a sort of flux flow, but it will be something called the uh, flux creep. So uh, we have something sluggish, you know, going from one configuration to the other. And it can happen to all these uh, vortices. So, um, but, you know, of course, you know, dissipation. Now I'm talking the dissipation that will allow or uh, prevent the tunneling of the vortex line itself, right? So uh, we have to take into account the difference between these two things. And dissipation now, I'm talking about dissipation that we will say, no, you know, the vortex line can be blocked or not, or the tunneling will be uh, much harder or much easier. It depends. So, but that will, uh, anything that I can measure, will have a very strong influence of this uh, microscopic damping for the dynamics of flux and things like that, or any other uh, macroscopic effective variable I can be playing with. Now, let's see, uh, for instance, uh, these e 2 barium copper oxide thin films. And uh, what is being measured here is the resistance, the resistivity I, I, I told you about. So this is a very, so what we have now are sort of pancake vortices. Since the, the film is quite uh, uh, thin, what happens is that uh, the vortex line is almost like a pancake cylinder, right? So you have many of those. And uh, now we can plot, for instance, this resistivity as a function of the inverse temperature. And then you see that, uh, as I showed you, for very low temperatures, I'm going to, uh, to the right of the axis, and then we see that there is the flattening of this curve. And that's a clear evidence of that uh, flattening of the uh, transition probability, right? Because it will freeze as for very, very low temperatures. And uh, as we go to high temperatures, so we approaching uh, zero here, we start to have something which is uh, the thermal activation. So uh, through the resistivity, so the uh, this sort of damp motion of the lines we, uh, we have flux flow here, so it's uh, that sort of avalanche I told you about. Or you can have the uh, quantum mechanical creep, so these uh, more erratic transitions and uh, more sluggish motion of these lines, and that has to do with the, uh, the quantum mechanical tunneling at very, very low temperatures. I can also uh, describe the... Uh, well, once we... Uh, study the uh, relaxation of the uh, magnetization of the system, uh, there is a sort of irreversible character of the uh, dynamics of this uh, magnetization. And we can show that uh, it has a log of T behavior. And again, for very different temperatures, we can plot, for instance, this behavior, this time dependence of the uh, relaxation of magnetization of the system. And uh, from this behavior here, again, we can plot the uh, lifetime of these uh, vortex lines in the uh, yttrium barium copper oxide. And again, for uh, very low temperatures, we have the freezing of this line. So the time will uh, be a constant for very low temperatures, signaling again in the direction of uh, some sort of a quantum mechanical effect at very, very low temperatures. And these are, I'm always uh, putting the references here. So you see that most of these uh, experimental results, they are basically at 20 years old, or a bit younger, but not much. And, uh, and in particular, the first one I told you about, if I'm not mistaken, is, is about, uh, it's almost 35 years old. It's from 88. Uh, now, another thing is this uh, sort of uh, superconducting uh, bridges connected by these uh, tiny uh, 
junction here, right? So we have this bridge, and it's basically a long Josephson junction connecting these two uh, parts of the uh, these two superconducting films, so to speak. And uh, then we can see that uh, for very low temperatures, that's the behavior of the voltage induced in this case as a function of the currents that are passing through the, uh, the system. And uh, then for high temperatures, it's the, uh, the power law with this N function. And this N is strongly uh, temperature dependent. So we see that uh, there is the dependence of temperature for high temperatures here, for instance, these red uh, uh, plots. These are the uh, high temperature behavior. And again, I, as I go to lower and lower temperatures, we start to have a sort of constant behavior. And again, this uh, N function here is a function of temperature, something like this. And again, we see that uh, that what point in the direction of something like uh, Arrhenius behavior when we are at higher temperatures. And in these two cases here for two different, uh, for two different width, uh, length, sorry, of the, uh, actually not actually the width of this uh, bridge here, we, uh, we have this uh, behavior of current in terms of uh, voltage. Right, so uh, again, we have the, uh, that's the low temperature behavior I told you about, and that's the higher one, right. Okay, so uh, I think that uh, these are the examples I wanted to, uh, to tell you about in terms of vortex lines and superconducting devices. Now, uh, let me try to say something about uh, the application, since we have these superconducting devices that are very tiny, we can use that with the same sort of electronics of uh, well-known computers. We can try to use them as qubits. And uh, so the idea, and that's exactly what people have been uh, trying to, uh, to build, is the uh, superconducting memories with these devices superconducting devices, or there are many other choices too, but what I'm going to address here is only the, the possibility of having superconducting devices since the whole uh, set of lectures uh, has been aimed at the uh, behavior, this macroscopic quantum behavior in superconductors. And so what we need, these are these sort of uh, T. Vincenzo uh, requirements for good qubits. And we need very well-defined two-state systems. We need accuracy to prepare any initial state. We must be sure of the initial state we are preparing. Right? Long phase coherence, of course. I want to uh, my I want to use these uh, the quantum mechanics of the uh, the two-state system. So I need it to be a coherently. Uh, going from one side to the other of the barrier, in the case of a squid ring, for instance, and uh, to perform many uh, logical operations. I need controllable effective fields in order to uh, control any sort of uh, uh, message I want to create in this uh, set of bits. And I also want to measure this, uh, the outcome of the uh, any sort of uh, time evolution of a set of qubits. So uh, these whole things, so that these are the requirements to have good qubits. Now, what I want to do is to, uh, since we can think of these devices, the superconducting devices as two state systems. So what we have is the qubit itself. So I'm going to refer uh, to uh, the two state system as my qubit and uh, there is the measuring apparatus. So we need to read, you know, any sort of message, message coming out uh, from that, or we can perform some, some sort of logical operations. And we have the environment. And the environment is always the one trying to destroy coherence. So uh, in order to uh, apply that, 
we need to go to very, very low temperatures. I don't know whether you've noticed that uh, we always operating below 50 mK in all those uh, examples I've given you of superconducting devices. So we need a very good way to reach very low temperatures and to man and to keep it at very low temperatures. So uh, when we have a sort of external field coupled to my uh, qubits, we have many of them, and uh, of course these two guys they communicate. So I want to uh, not only to address a single qubit, but this I must be prepared to use, for instance, the interaction between them in a coherent way, or to avoid any sort of uh, destructive destructive self-interaction between them that will act for a single qubit as a sort of environmental uh, effect. And the environment itself. So uh, we need to uh, study this sort of Hamiltonian, something like a Heisenberg uh, Hamiltonian that we can control the external field and also the exchange coupling between these uh, qubits. So the first one, the first example is the uh, is the flux qubit. Well, the flux qubit is nothing but the uh, my squid ring close to the flux, the external flux is uh, finite divided by two. That's exactly what you have here. If phi x is finite divided by two, we are exactly at the uh, degeneracy point. And uh, then in this case, we have one bz, which is uh, just uh, controlling these uh, two minimum positions, minimum positions, and the bx, the bx is intrinsic to the system. It is the, uh, is the measure of the tunneling rate from one side to the other of the barrier. So it's the tunneling matrix element between one side and the other side. And 2 pi L I naught pi by phi naught is that uh, parameter I told you about in the first lecture that tells me how many uh, minimum we will have in my in the potential. And uh, so that's exactly the uh, situation I presented as the one that uh, will generate coherent tunneling from one side to the other of the barrier. And uh, just a second. Okay, that's that's one possibility. The other one is uh, the other extreme of the uh, former example. I told you about that uh, the former example of the description of the flux as a coordinate or the phase of the wave function between the terminals of the junction as a position of a fictitious particle was a good example when we have a very strong Josephson coupling energy and very low capacity of energy for the junction. But we can also have the opposite situation when the capacity of energy, Q squared divided by 2C, is very large. Once this is very large, I showed you the other possibility to address the same problem. And uh, instead of controlling the current or the flux through the ring, we can just couple this uh, Josephson junction with very, very tiny capacitance by a gate voltage. And we can really control the sort of a gate charge. And uh, when we do that, we are, instead of thinking about the problem of a particle either in a sort of potential like that, because now it's a closed ring, but in the other case, it's only a junction. In the case of a junction, we were thinking about the phase difference. And then we had that sort of periodic potential that I can tilt with the external current. What we have now is a bit different. We can also choose to represent the same sort of system. But due to this uh, difference in the energy scales, we can also uh, make the option of study a uh, the junction by the charge we fitting in the system. So we can have one of these islands with no super, uh, no pair excess. 
right? And so it's n equal, n equals zero. In the other one, there is one Huber pair. And there is this level crossing here. Actually, uh, by the very end of the uh, first lecture, I told you about these uh, degeneracy of uh, charge on one side and the other side, and charge inverted plus the Cooper pair. So uh, then we have these two sort of configurations taking place. And of course, in one of them, we have to pay some sort of Josephson coupling energy for the uh, pair to tunnel from one side to the other. And then that's the picture that we have. We can either just zero tunneling here, or you can make some sort of law oscillations. And that's exactly about this uh, crossing here, where we have these, uh, these are the two states I'm talking about. So uh, in this case, again, we, uh, we have a two-state system, but now we have the two-state system, not the uh, flood state on one side or the other side of the barrier, but these uh, two states that appear you know, close to the, uh, exactly at the uh, level crossing. So uh, again, that's the so-called charge uh, qubit. One is the flux qubit, the other one is the charge qubit. So the charge qubit, I use the uh, Josephson junction, and instead of biasing the Josephson junction with current, I will make it very, very slowly, and I will change this uh, gate uh, charge. And again, that's the same sort of uh, physics that we uh, we have to study. Again, some sort of oscillations between one configuration and the other configuration. And this guy is again mapped by uh, spin boson Hamiltonian. Mind you, there is something else here, as I anticipated at the very beginning of this talk. We can also control this uh, Josephson coupling energy that will say something about the gap through the uh, external flux. But instead of using a single junction, I can use two junctions. And I can uh, bias some sort of internal flux here through these external. So I have some sort of uh, some other circuit, which is uh, inductively coupled to the uh, double junction. So I can control phi x. And if I control phi x, I can control the Josephson up. So that's the uh, charge qubit. We also have the phase qubit. The phase qubit is nothing but the, uh, the formal one, the one with a bias of current, but in such a way that I can only use these two states within the potential well of the uh, current bias junction. And uh, we have to make sure that it transitions to the other side would be very, very slow. And then I can use this guy here as the two-state system. Right. So uh, then we we have to operate with these microwave uh, bias and so on and so forth in order to make, in order to tune transitions between these two levels, whereas they are there. So uh, before they decay, right? Because once they decay, then forget it. You know, it's a... Uh, we, we cannot use them at the uh, two state anymore. Now, so I, I told you about two extremes. One of them is strong Josephson coupling energy. The other one, strong capacitive energy. But sometimes I can use something in between. And that's the case of the transmon. The transmon is nothing but the uh, charge, the, uh, the, 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 the the phase qubit, but the phase qubit that instead of changing this bias current, I will use the gate voltage. So uh, in this case here, for instance, if you have the charge qubit, this splitting here will be very small, right? And on the other hand, if I have the, uh, the other extreme, when we have some sort of tight binding model, what we have is the flattening of all these bands here. Then will be something closer to this description down here. So uh, this epsilon m, they are just telling us about the uh, 
this uh, uh, the width of the uh, the band. So the bandwidth that we have for this lowest line band here, so that's uh, epsilon zero, and then epsilon one. So these are these uh, bandwidth, right? And they are exponentially small in terms of just some coupling energy and capacitive energy. So if the capacitive energy is very large, so this, this guy here is no longer an exponential. So uh, the thing is, we can have either this sort of behavior, right? Or we can have something with very, very, very narrow bands. And these are much closer to the description of a uh, flux limit, right? So I can play with all these uh, devices and all these uh, parameters in order to make them phase qubits, flux qubit, and transmogs, for instance. And uh, of course, now, as I said, I'm always trying to find two-state systems, but these two-state systems in these devices, they are always coupled to some sort of very general environment. And I have to go back to the idea of the spin boson, how it truncates the dynamics of these more complex systems into some, something that is a two-state system coupled to an environment. And then how to uh, couple the environment itself to this two-state system. So uh, there is a way to, there are many ways to do that. And we always back to those two times, the T1 and T2 of NMR. One is the relaxation time that uh, drives the system to equilibrium. The other one is the dephasing time. So since the spin processes from one side to the other, there is this uh, dephasing time, which is basically twice the relaxation time but can be uh, much less than that. Because as we, uh, we've seen, you know, the effect of the damping and the mechanism of damping can make the phasing or decoherence much, much shorter than the usual relaxation time of the system. So we can put all that together and perform experiments either in flux qubits, in transmonds, or in charge qubits I told you about uh, two experimental evidences in the uh, phase, the Josephson junction, and the, uh, the squid ring. Now I can use the same sort of thing, by the same idea of playing with spin boson systems to try to see what happens to these uh, relaxation and the coherence times. Now, for instance, for the Cooper pair box, the Cooper pair box is nothing but the charge qubit. And so what these guys do is to make a nice device they call the controlium. And uh, with that, again, two-state system, bath. We can also uh, bias that with some sort of microwave current again. And switching probability will be described in terms of some Rabi oscillations. And we can also put some pulses, distant pulses of uh, current in this uh, device and study uh, Ramsey uh, interference, right? And these are the parameters here, for instance, for uh, this uh, controlium and 15 millik for the, that's the temperature and that's the, uh, the phasing time, for instance. And uh, so we see that the phasing time is much shorter than this, uh, the inverse of this uh, level splitting here. Uh, also, I told you about the uh, possibility of using uh, the Josephson junction as, uh, as a qubit once we uh, neglect this uh, decay time. So again, we can study the uh, this uh, transition probability from one uh, 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 level to the other by using uh, one external microwave current. And again, everything that we can see here points in the direction of coherent oscillations, 
or level structure. It's quite clear that there is a level structure there. So uh, I think that these are quite clear uh, experimental evidences that uh, these uh, phenomena do occur. And secondly, that uh, they can have very uh, important technological applications. And now, uh, just a few words about uh, this transmon. Transmons are quite fashionable nowadays. People are using this, uh, the idea of this uh, phase junction fed by a uh, gate charge. And uh, so there is a uh, compromise between the Josephson coupling energy and capacitive energy. And uh, so these are the uh, sort of uh, devices being used as qubits, because in these ones, I will show you next, that you can have very, very long uh, decoherence times. And that's what is desirable for these systems, that you can really perform many logical operations during these uh, coherent oscillations of the system. So here is a picture of uh, in terms of 2000, 2004, until uh, six years ago, the uh, distribution of lifetime in microseconds of all these devices, Cooper pair boxes, Contronium, flux qubits, and so on and so forth. And now, for instance, T1 and T2 is the relaxation time and phasing time or the coherence time. And then you see that uh, this time is really increasing. So uh, we can perform these uh, coherent oscillations for a much longer time. And in particular, we have also, people have also developed this uh, quantum error correction. So uh, it's something that has to do with the, uh, how we can implement error correction just by coupling our, using many physical qubits as a logical qubit. And for instance, we can do that with the uh, so-called it's uh, just a second here. I have to move my bar. Okay, these bosonic encoded qubits, because we are coupling for some physical qubits, we, we can place it, a set of qubits, superconducting, uh, superconducting ones, in this uh, uh, superconducting cavity. And uh, so you have electromagnetic modes there, and you can have, for instance, many photons coupled to some state of the qubit, and you can use that in order to perform quantum error correction. And this, and this sort of procedure is improving a lot, this uh, lifetime of the qubits. So in order to reach, to attain, you know, the uh, sole desired uh, uh, quantum, how do people call it? I, I forgot the name now. Quantum supremacy, right? And uh, so we have many uh, candidates for superconducting devices. They seem to be uh, playing a very nice role as far as the uh, development of these new uh, quantum memories are concerned. So uh, now, final comments. Uh, I'm reaching the uh, end of the talk or the course. Um, so let me. Uh, draw very uh, general conclusions about everything I've been saying during these three days. Uh, first of all, importance of these uh, superconducting and systems, devices or films, because, you know, uh, we, we show that uh, using them, we can really uh, think of quantum mechanics applied to, uh, to very bizarre sort of states that we can really think of uh, macroscopic quantum mechanical superpositions and things like that. Although I've been addressing the problem of superconductors, the physics present here is the same that shows up in many sort of BC geometries and you can use that magnetic systems too in many other circumstances. Uh, the second thing is that uh, since they involve macroscopic states or macroscopic or nanoscopic configurations, they are very, very hard to be uh, decoupled from physical environments. So uh, what we have 
with a strong connection between uh, these effects and dissipative effects. And I, I hope to have told you how to deal with those in many uh, circumstances. So, uh, but in a sense, this sort of macroscopic quantum phenomenon and uh, dissipation, these two guys seem to be inseparable. Third, uh, this semi-phenomenological approach to quantum dissipation, namely that uh, the minimal model of harmonic oscillators and things like that, proved to be uh, quite useful. So we could really uh, apply that to many, uh, many different systems, from superconductors to uh, magnetic systems and many other systems. And uh, of course, it's not 100% general, but uh, it seems to, to give a good hint of what is really the effect, what are the effects of damping and uh, coupling to the environment with these sort of quantum mechanical effects. Um, Feynman methods, why I applied Feynman uh, path integral methods? Because I think that uh, due to the uh, fact that we have this uh, harmonic bath and uh, the way we address the system is really much easier to play with approximations in the path integrals and, uh, and of course, as, we, uh, as we've seen, it's uh, in many cases, we cannot really have instantaneous uh, description of uh, our influence function, also to speak. So uh, what's the uh, consequence of that? The consequence of that is that I cannot really have sort of instantaneous master equation. So uh, people really like and I think that 90% of the community like to play with master equations. And fine, that's good. I have nothing against master equations. But the thing is that we have a way to approach the problem where you don't need to bother about the memory effects or it's already there. And once we have harmonic systems, we can integrate them exactly. So no approximation. And when we have to make some approximations, they are quite controllable in a sense that uh, you can make the uh, WKB approximation and things like that. So, uh, and usually uh, master equations, they are useful at very high temperatures at any damping or at very low damping at any temperature. So then we can really show from the path integrals to, we can go to master equations. And mind you, what many people in the literature Say some say always our oh, Caldera Leggett master equation. There is no such a thing. I'm sorry to say, we, we really wrote a master equation, but this master equation makes sense only for very high temperatures. So, if you want to be uh, precise, what you have to do is to uh, take the Wigner transform of our reduced density operator and talk about Wigner functions that turn out to be. Uh, the dancing phase space at very high temperatures. So uh, the thing is, these master equations, some of them, they are designed for very high temperatures. So we have to be very careful with this. And uh, the problem, I, I just said, you know, uh, some words about this uh, collision model and the collective coordinate model. And uh, it's really nice when we have when we, we, we can really uh, make sure you want to address the issue of damping or vortex or some sort of soliton-like excitations in the system. And we can uh, compare, for instance, the minimum model result with something else, namely uh, this uh, approach that we uh, apply collective coordinates to the system and we can just follow the uh, dynamics of skirmions in magnetic systems or these bright or dark solitons in uh, bullseyes and condensates. And uh, fine. Uh, so uh, we have experimental realizations of many of these uh, examples I've given you. And um, so we have in superconductors, superconducting devices, magnetic particles. I didn't mention magnetic particles, but 
we, we could do easily. We could easily do that. And uh, nano electromechanical devices among others. Final and finally, uh, relevance for well, many things: testing quantum mechanics at the macroscopic level, and uh, foundation of quantum mechanics. Many people uh, like to uh, address quantum theory of measurement by uh, coherence. And uh, some people are very happy with that. Some other people are not. And I do not want to uh, discuss it now. But uh, that's a sort of a long stay, long stay, long standing debate in the community. And uh, so can you really uh, account for a quantum theory of measurement if we only take the coherence into account? And, and well, what is the relevance of all that to uh, the quantum theory of measurement? And uh, another thing, I showed you that uh, all these technological advances with the uh, superconducting devices, making them as good candidates for uh, uh, computer, uh, quantum computer memory, as a, using them as qubits. Uh, other things, nano-electromechanical systems, they can be uh, quite useful if we, uh, we can set up many uh, sort of uh, quantum engines in such a way that you can perform what people are nowadays calling quantum thermodynamics. So all these sort of uh, devices, nano devices, they are quite useful to test the limits. And when, you know, uh, this macroscopic uh, physics start to meet microscopic quantum or molecular level physics. And finally, other applications, of course, would be to either for the lack of time or the ignorance of the speaker. I thank you very much. It was my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Professor. Now you have uh, we open for questions, please. From the audience, uh, from the we have a chat, and uh, don't have question on the chat. I think. Okay, but professor, uh, I have more a comment than a question. Uh, as you show us, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, advances on the uh, as theoretical and experimental sides uh, on this area. Uh, and if you think it's very promi pro promising. But what kind of challenges do you think you, you have as a, as a theoretician on this area to overcome? Uh, well, 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 the thing is, at, at the present stage, I will say that uh, the basic ideas of what must be applied to these systems, they have been, uh, you know, uh, they have been dealt with during the last, say, uh, 40 years. So, uh, as I showed you, you know, uh, many of these evidences, uh, they almost, for, for, for instance, in superconducting devices, they were, uh, those experimental results, they are dated, oh, you know, uh, 20 years. They are 20 years old now. So uh, many of these experiments are now quite, quite old. And, uh, but we, we have all these. Uh, so the thing now is really to, uh, is more on the uh, technical and experimental level, really to try to uh, build, you know, uh, reliable systems where we can use all these uh, theory and uh, in order to apply that in technologically. And uh, so uh, basically that's what it is. And I don't see uh, any sort of real new uh, challenge here, except for the, uh, the case that we are making our systems smaller and smaller. And, uh, and then we are reaching this uh, nice region where both quantum mechanics and uh, thermodynamics, for instance, they coexist 
And these, uh, as I said here, quantum engines and quantum thermodynamics, you know, uh, how we, m we must change the laws of thermodynamics. And well, I don't like that actually, because uh, I don't think that's what happens. The thing is, we must know exactly where we do apply the uh, laws of thermodynamics. And uh, the thing is how we, uh, we can compare to this, uh, in this uh, nowhere land, or you know, no one, no one's land, you know, uh, how do they, uh, how can we reconcile things? And I think that on the theoretical side, that's the challenges. And, uh, but I don't think there is anything more fundamental, right? But what we are saying is that uh, unless you can tell me that uh, we've been measuring something uh, on a given device, that uh, we, we have, for instance, a new result that uh, was not uh, foreseen by any, any of these uh, theories here, then in this case you could say, well, let's test it. Let's see exactly what happens. Let's try, let's exhaust all these possibilities here, right, of dealing with quantum damping, well, uh, with this dissipative tunneling or quantum coherence, whatever, and then we cannot account for those. Then you really have something new coming out of these uh, experimental results. Otherwise, you know, I think that uh, what you have to do now is really to address some sort of specific systems mm -hmm. and uh, to build them, to build even more interesting systems in the sense that uh, they will present very nice quantum mechanical effects and we can beat, for instance, the uh, deleterious effects of, uh, of damping and uh, all that is quite nice. But again, it's, uh, the challenge is much more uh, on the uh, technological approach to the problem and how we build that. Or, you know, uh, if we start to discuss, I, are these states really macroscopic or not? And uh, again, you know, many people do not agree with this. And uh, so it's an open, many of these things are still uh, open questions. But uh, to my mind, as far as I'm concerned, I'm quite happy with most of what I've said. So. Okay, thank you. I'm, it is a very nice uh, um, area to explore, right? <laughs> Let's test, no? Let's see the next uh, uh, things happen, so. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, lectures and uh, enjoy the, our school, thank you. Let's thank you again, Professor Caldeira. Bye-bye. <laughs>
y Manuel. Ok, good. Uh, we have now the third and last talk from Tommaso in the school. So Tommaso, thank you again from, for being with us. And please, it's your time. Ok, thank, thank you Manuel. I cannot see you, I just see the audience uh, broadly, but uh, it's ok. Uh, so, uh, good morning everyone, again, uh, for this uh, third and last uh, lecture of uh, this series. Uh, before starting, I would like to, like yesterday, to uh, basically quickly review the content of the previous two lectures. So, in the first one, I discussed about the concept of uh, quantum simulation and how uh, quantum simulation uh, um, actually emerges as a subfield of a broader area like quantum technology. In the second lecture, I introduced uh, the concept of uh, long-range interactions. And in particular, I discussed uh, the concept of long-range interactions in the, in, uh, the so-called scattering uh, uh, sense, so within uh, the properties of uh, uh, scattering between two particles with the short and long-range interactions. Where end, I compared it to the uh, case of uh, statistical, of the use of uh, the word long-range in the statistical sense. Now in this, uh, and then uh, in the last part of the of, uh, of yesterday's talk, uh, I essentially presented uh, a couple of platforms, uh, mainly essentially uh, Rydberg atoms and uh, the polar systems, uh, and discussed uh, some uh, basic properties of the two systems. In the in the, at the beginning of this lecture, I would like to uh, now review the con the interaction properties of. Uh, Uh, Rydberg atoms. Yesterday we discussed about the electronic properties and how they are characterized at the single particle level. Today I would like to start by uh, now adding more ingredients uh, to build up from the uh, starting from the concept of single Rydberg atom to many Rydberg atoms. And finally, in the last part of the, of the presentation, I will discuss a couple of applications uh, of uh, long range interactions at the many body level. And if you uh, remind uh, um, in the, the part of uh, part of the discussion that I made uh, at the beginning of the last lecture, I said that depending on the uh, type of uh, physical phenomenon that you would like to, to address, long range actually means different things. So we discussed about scattering, we discussed about um, uh, statistical mechanics, And uh, in this last lecture, I would also like to make some, uh, some uh, formal observations uh, regarding how uh, long range and more broadly non-local interactions can be addressed uh, in uh, uh, many body systems. Okay, so uh, I will now switch to my, to my notes. Uh, I apologize again if uh, you cannot read my, my writing, but I will try to be as clear as possible. So uh, let's, now, let's now try to... Um, consider two Rydberg atoms that I here I schematize uh, simply as a, a sort of classical uh, spheres. Uh, one, uh, the red one is uh, the electron in the external shell, and the blue one corresponds to the nucleus plus uh, the, uh, the core electrons, essentially. The two L atoms are uh, uh, at a distance, uh, uh, or actually the two nuclei have a distance R, which is typically much larger than distance from the nucleus from uh, the respective electrons, which are denoted by R1 and R2. And then the Hamiltonian uh, of each individual atom is uh, essentially represented by a kinetic term plus uh, an effective interaction that we discussed yesterday, which resembles the one of the hydrogen, uh, of the hydrogen atom plus uh, possible corrections that, as we saw, give rise uh, to uh, non-Coulomb-like interactions and therefore they can be introduced uh, or they can be um, discussed in the context of perturbation theory. Instead, the interaction between, uh, the interaction between nucleus and, uh, and electrons uh, and in, in this sort of four particle system is just uh, Coulomb-like, if you wish. And taking uh, these R much larger than Ri, we can essentially expand this uh, uh, potential energy term As a, as a function of as essentially as a Taylor, <clears throat> Taylor expanding around the point x equal to zero. 
So what does it mean? Uh, so I will not do all the calculations. I think that uh, I mean all, all all of these are really basic steps. And again, uh, I would like to. Um, I'm available also to share the note, my notes uh, with you at any moment. So just let me go to the to the main point here. Uh, the most important thing is that uh, when you sum up uh, all the terms uh, in this expansion, you end up. Uh, so I, I just now go to the final result. Uh, you end up uh, with uh, a dipole-dipole uh, interaction. So you immediately recognize uh, that, it, of course, it's not not surprise at all because it just uh, the, the simple exercise that you do also in classical electrodynamics. So if you think uh, of uh, the two Rydberg atoms as two um, electric dipoles, then uh, of course uh, this is no surprise that you should get uh, a dipole-dipole interaction. Now, where does uh, quantum mechanics actually comes in? Well, uh, it comes in when you start uh, doing uh, essentially you want to uh, basically define a certain initial state for your to see for your two particle system and treat this interaction in perturbation theory. Now, it is a sort of immediate to see that uh, the first order, the first order um, of the perturbation theory with this uh, interaction potential has to give uh, uh, must give zero, so must vanish. And the reason is that if the two atoms uh, are uh, uh, in a state with well-defined quantum numbers, and one uh, L1 and M1, and then two L2 M2, then uh, because of uh, symmetry uh, reasons, then uh, you have uh, to get zero, because you see here you have a square, right? You have the, uh, phi one square, phi two square. Here you have V, but then you are integrated over L1 and R2. And you see that here in the interaction put in the perturbing, uh, perturbative, uh, perturb in, sorry, in the perturbation potential, you get any uh, R1 and R2. And therefore, in each, each one of the two integrals essentially must, uh, must vanish. Now, what is the first uh, uh, relevant uh, contribution? Well, the first relevant contribution is the second order. And the second order, is uh, instead non vanishing uh, because, of course, of the structure of the second order perturbation, uh, perturbation term to the, to the energy. And here, the important thing uh, I will not do the explicit calculation, which is uh, nevertheless not so complicated uh, in principle. But uh, I want to stress that since uh, the dipolar interaction is like one over r cube, the second order term in perturbation theory should scale as 1 over r to the 6. With the prefactor that actually contains all the sum over this intermediate state alpha of the spectrum, essentially, you will get uh, that uh, in the ground state, uh, delta E is, of course, uh, uh, negative. Okay, And the reason is that, of course, these ter all these terms have a positive uh, numerator. Whereas all the denominators are, of course, uh, uh, negative because if it's zero is the ground state, then uh, all these terms, uh, it's zero minus the alpha is uh, smaller than zero. So we can conclude that, that uh, the interaction uh, is, uh, in general, attractive if two atoms are in the ground state. Okay, so this is an important statement, and that's why typically we assume that Van der Waals interactions are attractive. However, uh, and this is also an important uh, statement. This is not true if we actually start, uh, so if we, uh, if we start our perturbation theory calculation from uh, an excited state. So in general, the uh, first order contribution is always uh, uh, zero for party reasons. However, the second order can be either attractive or repulsive. And I want to show you uh, basically a sort of schematic model that uh, displays uh, these properties. So suppose uh, that uh, instead of taking uh, uh, the uh, electrons in the lowest um, energy state, uh, we consider a simplified three-state system where we basically initially populate uh, the two atoms in the state uh, zero. So I call this the zero one, so, uh, underscore one here, in the we index one, uh, the state of the first atom, zero to the state of the second atom. And then we have two close by states uh, that I call plus uh, and minus, uh, so one and two, of course, for the two atoms, that have uh, an energy epsilon plus uh, and epsilon minus. Okay. 
Now, for uh, uh, this state uh, should be in a way coupled, so to, for the model to be non-trivial, these two states uh, should be coupled to the zero state. Uh, and therefore, we can assume, uh, for example, that uh, uh, the state zero is an S state, so with the angular norm into, uh, uh, L equal to zero, and the plus and minus are two states uh, with the uh, um, angular momentum L equal to one, so they are P states. So essentially the transition, the dipole transition are not, uh, are, are essentially allowed, okay? So uh, the, in the dipole approximation, of course, the, 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 we assume that these couplings therefore are, uh, are zero, so the transition from plus and minus are zero, and the transition from plus to zero with the, here with the operator R, <coughs> we call it D plus, and the same thing analog, analogously. We call it D minus the transition operator between minus and zero. Okay, so uh, another thing, so we assume that the single particle energies are uh, respectively positive and negative, so epsilon plus is positive, epsilon minus is negative. Uh, the energy of the initial state, so the zero, zero state is, uh, is zero. The energy of the double excited state is uh, two epsilon plus, to epsilon minus uh, the, the energy of the W, uh, so the, the, the state uh, for the state uh, in which the two electrons occupy the minus minus state. And uh, the uh, energy when you basically have one electron in the plus, one electron in the minus state uh, is epsilon plus plus epsilon minus, that we call it uh, minus delta, okay? And uh, okay, we can call it also epsilon plus or minus. So in principle, you see that depending on the location or the energy mismatch between epsilon plus and epsilon minus, this delta can be either positive or negative. So it's just a simple, uh, it's just a parameter at the moment. Now we assume also to simplify the calculations so that uh, epsilon plus plus, epsilon minus minus are much larger than this energy difference, so than this delta. And then we can essentially dynamically decouple these two uh, Highly excited states, so epsilon plus plus, epsilon minus minus minus. So essentially, the states where we cap, where the electrons are both in the excited state or both uh, so in the plus state or in the minus state. So eventually, we end up with a much smaller uh, system to to treat. And to simplify, we consider uh, also a, um, a just a, a part of the polar interaction. For our purposes, this is enough. So suppose that they suffer an interaction, which is R1 uh, uh, scalar product R2 divided by R cube. We then define the states, uh, the symmetric and the symmetric states that we call P and M. So it is plus minus plus minus plus over square root of two and uh, minus sign for the uh, M state. So let me now try to be clearer. So because I guess that uh, if I, I went a little bit too fast, but I hope that it was uh, clear enough. Now we can compute the matrix elements of these uh, uh, perturbations so for, the, uh, for this interaction between uh, atoms one and two. Uh, for uh, these uh, reduced basic states, because we said that, okay, we eliminated the states plus plus, uh, the states minus minus, because they are very far in energy. And we, work, we want to work uh, with the states that are actually closer to the zero, zero state. Now we immediately realize that for uh, symmetry reasons, so the state at zero, zero is not coupled to this uh, M state, so to the anti-symmetric state. Instead, it is coupled to the state P, so plus minus plus minus plus, and the coupling is just given by square root of two, D plus D minus over uh, R cube, where I just want to remind you that D plus is the coupling between uh, uh, the state zero and the state uh, uh, plus. And the minus just is the coupling, the dipole coupling between zero and minus. Now we call it this uh, as this square over R cube, uh, just the definition. And therefore we end up with a much simpler, much, much simpler model that our initial uh, uh, nine state system. Uh, because uh, the only coupling, so the, the state zero, zero is just coupled to the plus state, to the P state. And so in this two by two matrix, uh, which basically oversimplifies the problem, we see that uh, only three terms are actually no vanishing. The third, the uh, off diagonal terms, which are the couplings between the states uh, zero and P, so the square of R cube, 
and uh, the uh, energy of this uh, state, which is uh, minus delta. Okay, because we have one atom in plus and one atom in, uh, in the minus state. Okay, so now we, what we have to do essentially is uh, to diagonalize this uh, two by two matrix, which is that uh, we can do it uh, with uh, our eyes, the, our uh, eyes closed essentially. And what we find is that the energies are uh, uh, just uh, given by this uh, simple expression. So, they, of course, they depend on delta and they depend on uh, this uh, dipole coupling D over R to the 6. Okay? Now, we want to consider, of course, that of course we have two eigenvalues, uh, plus and minus, and uh, we want to, the only physical one is the one that actually couples uh, or connects uh, to uh, the energy of the zero, zero state. Okay? So, it will depend essentially on the sign of delta and on the plus or minus, by the choice of plus or minus, okay? So, if we do this calculation, we find that uh, E of R, the only relevant eigenvalue, is just given by this expression here. And this will be essentially the contribution of uh, the uh, perturbation V of R, that we call W of R, that will correspond to the essential interaction term between these two particles, okay? A distance R. Now, it turns out that when W of R is uh, positive, which, uh, which takes place for delta larger than zero, the, the interaction will be repulsive. Instead, when W of R is negative for delta smaller than zero, the interaction will be attractive. So you immediately see that there is a, a, a strong difference between the, uh, from, from, from this case uh, compared to the case where the two uh, atoms or the two electrons occupy the lowest, so the really the ground state. In the ground state, the van der Waals interaction, which is which scales as one over R to the six, is always negative. However, if we excite these two particles, the two electrons, into an excited state, then we don't we cannot expect this interaction to be a priori uh, positive or negative. So to be or actually to be negative, uh, to be still negative. One should really investigate what happens to the couplings of these two states with the, the nearest uh, electronic state. So depending uh, on whether these couplings, I mean, uh, depending on the strength of these uh, couplings and the energy mismatch, uh, this interaction can be actually positive, uh, can be repulsive or attractive. Now we consider uh, also two different limits. The first limit is when essentially this term is much smaller than this one. Okay, in, the, in this, uh, the expression for the energy or for the interaction potential. And therefore, what we say, what we see is that uh, this interaction indeed the scales as one over R to the six. Okay, and we can uh, make a connection to the van der Waals radius that we defined yesterday. Instead, when uh, this term is much larger than one, which means that the second term in the square group is much larger than the first one, we see that uh, the interaction case as one over r cube so it uh, goes like a dipolar interaction okay even though we are treating this the problem in second order perturbation theory so what we can say is that uh, even though the, these the two atoms are just fluctuating dipoles uh, depending on the relative distance uh, the interaction can be either van der Waals or can be dipolar okay now of course, uh, another important uh, observation is that uh, it's just a sort of an oversimplified uh, model. We cannot trust it uh, to the point where we can really do much uh, if we want to compare uh, this um, sort of model to a realistic experiment. Because uh, if we really want to be predictive, uh, we really need to do uh, numerical simulations to address really thousands or even uh, tens of thousands of electronic states to be precise, to make uh, uh, precise uh, um, predictions uh, on what happens between the two interaction between two Hilbert atoms. But basically, I think that this uh, simple model, this simple uh, three-state model for each one of the two atoms actually grasps already the, the main uh, uh, content of, uh, of this message, okay? So let me uh, try also to be a little bit more general. I want to just comment on the fact that uh, in reality, there are also different types of mechanisms uh, that uh, um, can give rise to other types of uh, interaction potentials. So depending on really on the, uh, the tune or the initial state, so in, for our purposes, 
for the presentation of this previous model, I was just considering a state where all the two electrons sit in the same electronic state that we label, uh, I mean, whose quantum numbers are represented schematically by this alpha for the first atom and alpha for the second. And therefore, we explored the coupling of these two double excited states to nearest neighbor states, beta and, and gamma. And on, for large distances, we saw that it should go like a matter of interaction. However, the, this double excited state can be resonant to other states. And so we get what is called a forced resonance, which is a mechanism that is very much uh, exploited uh, in the, also in the context of uh, other fields, uh, like, for example, uh, in, um, in biology or quantum biology, to explain uh, the transport of excitations uh, in um, certain uh, uh, processes like, for example, photosynthesis. And then uh, the other type of uh, interaction is the usual dipole dipole interaction, that where basically we can explore, uh, uh, we can explore the fact that if you now couple, uh, if you now prepare your initial state in two different Rydberg states, uh, alpha and beta, which are dipole coupled, uh, then uh, you can exploit, you can expect that this interaction gives rise to what are called the flip flop interactions, which basically uh, flips uh, the first one uh, and uh, the second one uh, to get uh, essentially to a degenerate state uh, alpha, beta alpha. Then uh, another mechanism that is uh, particularly interesting also for applications uh, is uh, the so-called dressing mechanism where a, uh, a double excited state, uh, sorry, where uh, an initial state can be excited far off resonantly to a, uh, an excited, uh, to a double excited state uh, here labeled by PE. And what uh, happens here is that instead of having the usual sort of power law interaction with uh, a repulsive, uh, infinite repulsive core when R goes to zero, we get uh, in this uh, dressing scheme uh, a so what is called the soft core interaction, where basically the, the interaction still decays as a power law like a Van der Waals interaction, for example, at very large distances. But then it goes to a constant when uh, the particles uh, will goes, uh, go closer and closer. And uh, regarding this, I mean, all of these uh, uh, systems or uh, types of interactions, there have been uh, several experiments over the past uh, uh, few years. And if you really want to have uh, an overview, there are these last two reviews uh, which are relatively complete. <clears throat> or uh, I also give a brief uh, a summary in the review that I advertised yesterday that we submitted in uh, uh, last uh, September. Okay, so that's it for the uh, part on uh, interactions between the Rydberg atoms. Let me try to now uh, motivate uh, uh, how this uh, interaction can give rise to interesting uh, uh, many body phases. And for this, I would really like to uh, invoke uh, again the, those distinctions, those uh, classifications that I made regarding uh, the importance of long-range interactions compared, I mean, in different types uh, of uh, fields uh, of physics. In this case, we are interested in, into the many-body effects of uh, different types of interactions. So for the simplest one, which is uh, an hard core, uh, we would call it a short-range or local interaction, we would expect uh, uh, the system essentially, or uh, a bunch of particles, to behave essentially like a fluid for very small densities. Whereas when we increase the density of the, of the particles, we expect uh, a transition to a solid, okay? And in particular, if we are in two dimension, what we would expect is a transition from a, a fluid to a crystalline, a triangular crystalline uh, state. When uh, instead the interaction is purely uh, non, still non local, but or uh, quasi non local, quasi you know, you know, finite range with the range of sigma one, but now we remove uh, this hardcore constraint uh, and basically the interaction is flat uh, here. Now what happens is that particles can overlap. So if particles can overlap, they can also in principle try to form patterns where instead of having one particle per lattice site, we can have several particles per lattice site, and therefore they can form a, what we call a cluster or a droplet. And therefore the uh, elementary elements, the elementary pieces of our, uh, of our lattice are no more single particles, but these clusters. 
and therefore in particular one can form with Weber atoms uh, what are called uh, cluster supersolids. They are called supersolids because they can they can uh, they display both uh, um, translational symmetry breaking in the sense that they form a, a crystal, and uh, in parallel they also display finite uh, superfluid fraction, which gives rise uh, to um, genuine uh, superfluid phases or superfluid fluid, superfluid effects. Then uh, there are other types of uh, potentials, of course. Uh, there are uh, these uh, sort of hardcore plus uh, dipolar tail, which is also a model potential for standard dipolar systems. And for this, uh, one can realize the, the usual droplets uh, or uh, uh, super solid phases that have been recently observed in, uh, in dipolar systems. And finally, I would like to mention this com the combination of uh, actually the two ingredients that we see in the upper part of the plot, which is uh, the uh, so-called hard uh, soft core interaction. It is hard soft because it has an hard core potential up to a length, uh, up to a distance of sigma zero. And then uh, there is a soft core uh, plateau between a sigma zero and a sigma one. Okay. So at the many body level, what what should we expect from uh, this type of interaction? Well, uh, it is certainly a little bit more complicated than the, the first two. We would expect in principle a sort of mix between the two phases uh, that uh, each one of the two displays. With a small uh, uh, cover, because now particles, uh, differently from this, uh, cannot uh, overlap uh, anymore for distances which are smaller than uh, uh, sigma zero. But on the other hand, there are two length scales. So there are there is a competition, if you wish, of sigma zero and uh, of the length scale sigma zero and sigma one. Now, interestingly, these uh, uh, types of uh, interaction potentials have been uh, explored quite a lot in the classical uh, uh, regime, where uh, it is expected that these types of interaction would represent uh, the sort of an effective uh, potential between uh, polymers, dendrites, uh, micellis, and other biological, um, uh, or basically, uh, objects. And uh, uh, for this, uh, basically, for this effective interaction, one would expect at the many body level a bunch of interesting phases that go beyond the usual liquid and triangular crystalline phase, like, for example, the formation of labyrinth or even uh, sort of quasi-crystalline phases. And uh, here you see a sort of nice uh, uh, collection of uh, uh, quantum, uh, oh, sorry, of uh, uh, classical phases that arise with this uh, two scale potential that can be obtained by varying uh, the uh, ratio between uh, the, uh, the uh, second length scale sigma one compared uh, divided by the first one sigma zero. So you move, uh, you can move uh, the along this direction. So moving this ratio or you can move in along the vertical direction, which essentially would correspond to varying the density of the system. And if you look at this sort of a relatively uh, complicated uh, phase diagram, you will find uh, a bunch of complicated uh, quasi-crystalline um, phases. Now, the whole, uh, the whole question that we tried to address recently was uh, whether these types of phases can be stabilized down at zero temperature and if they uh, show any superflu genuine superfluid phase. Something that, of course, you cannot expect uh, from a, a standard or simple uh, uh, classical uh, uh, simulations. Now, we try to address this problem by means of uh, um, particular Monte Carlo methods. And what we found uh, is that, uh, indeed, there are interesting phases. Uh, you see here this blue. Uh, here we are varying, uh, essentially, the height or the strength of the uh, soft core interaction, which that we label by epsilon, and along the vertical axis uh, we vary density. And here we see that uh, a big region of a of a superfluid phase, which then uh, becomes uh, at larger intense, a larger interactions, uh, either a triangular phase or uh, again a superfluid plus uh, a striped phase, a labyrinth phase, and uh, an honeycomb uh, lattice. And finally, there is a sort of phase coexistence here, or metastable phase in the middle. And for very large densities, we end up again into the triangular uh, lattice. Now, how do we 
the, the question is, can we find a, a regime of parameters where we uh, are able to to see the, the quasi-crystalline phase like in the classical uh, regime? So is there a true uh, quantum quasi-crystal like in the classical, which is the analog of the classical quasi-crystal? Well, the answer apparently is yes, because if we tune the ratio between sigma 1 and sigma 0 to a value which is 1.75, we end up and tune also properly the density, we see that for sufficiently large densities, we encounter a phase which very well uh, represents what is nowadays called a sort of a square triangle tiling for the two-dimensional plane. So the idea is that uh, we need to fill all, uh, we can fill the whole plane in terms of patterns that uh, can be really much represented by just uh, squares that connect where the square is just uh, a, where whose vertex is basically the center of masses of the uh, each particle or tri or equilateral triangles as you can see here so in principle if you really mm, uh, check in detail uh, this configuration you will see that you can all you can just uh, form uh, only squares and triangle uh, in, uh, in equilibrium and so this is actually one kind of quasi-crystal. How can we uh, be sure about that? Well, we can, there are several types of checks that we can do. So the first one is, of course, to compute the uh, Fourier spectrum of uh, this uh, density pattern. And if you do this, so you see that for a usual uh, triangular lattice, you will just see six uh, main peaks apart from the central peak. Instead, for the square triangle uh, tiling, you will see that uh, you have the central peak plus uh, 12 uh, peaks around, which means that you have uh, what is called a dodecagonal uh, uh, ordering. So to be even more quantitative, you can compute a parameter, which is called uh, the bond order parameter, which is defined in here. This is a sort of a, a generalization of the exotic order parameter, where here we Essentially, the M is the order, is the index of uh, the, the associated to that uh, to, to this order parameter, and it basically it tells us uh, which kind of uh, ordering will dominate. So, and this theta b, theta b is essentially the angle formed by two uh, edges that connect the centers of the, of the central masses of the particles. So, if you compute theta b for all pairs of uh, uh, of bonds, you and average over all uh, the possible bonds in the, in the configuration, you will find uh, uh, something like uh, these two curves as a function of the density. So we see that for a sufficiently low density, the system displays a very nice uh, uh, hexagonal uh, uh, bond order uh, uh, parameter, which is compatible with the triangular lattice. Instead, for larger values of, uh, of the density, the uh, the decagonal path, the decagonal the parameter will uh, dominate. And so this is again uh, a confirmation of the fact that uh, at least at the quantum, that at the quantum level we uh, can form uh, a, a the decagonal quasi crystal. Now, this is just an application. Uh, now I would like to move to another example that uh, apparently is very far from uh, what I just discussed now, but still has to do with uh, the application of uh, long-range interactions. And now I want to discuss the phenomenon which is uh, um, very well known in uh, high energy physics, uh, which is called uh, quantum uh, confinement. Uh, this quantum confinement is essentially responsible for the fact that you cannot uh, observe uh, a single uh, uh, quarks uh, uh, isolated, but you can also see these quarks uh, either in pairs uh, to form mesons or uh, in triplets to form uh, baryons. Now, of course, uh, this topic is very far from uh, what you are, we are talking about uh, right now, in, uh, because also in terms of not only of landscapes and densities or energies, but also for the models that we, we can currently uh, simulate with ultra cold atoms. I would like to expose instead a much simplified feature of uh, of this uh, confinement uh, that can be simulated either with Redberg atoms or, uh, or ions, uh, that, is, that is based on the simulation essentially of the short range and the long range uh, uh, Ising model. So 
Uh, the ISIM model is essentially a, a very well-known model in statistical physics that is made of three different parts. So here we have uh, a coupling uh, along the sigma z between two different neighboring uh, spins with uh, an amplitude that is given by uh, j or minus j. So when j is positive, the system is ferromagnetic, where j is negative, the system is antiferromagnetic. Then we have a transverse field, which is proportional to this uh, parameter hx. And finally, we have a longitudinal field here that I labeled in red, that is proportional to hz. Okay? Now, the, in the, without this longitudinal field, we also know that uh, in uh, even 1D, the system displays uh, uh, two different phases. Uh, one which is a ferromagnetic phase with two degenerate uh, ground states, uh, where all the spins uh, point up or down, and the paramagnetic phase uh, where the, 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 sorry, the spins align along the direction of, uh, of the field. And here I'm just showing the, uh, the, um, the product state, so the ground state, which is the product state of all spins uh, pointing uh, along the x direction. So this is an eigenstate of the sigma x operator. Now, in uh, the ferromagnetic phase, uh, the elementary excitations are what are called uh, kinks. They are not uh, the spin flips. Because uh, if you just flip one spin in the ferromagnetic phase, uh, you will actually uh, gain uh, an energy which is given by 2j, two two right? Because uh, you will flip uh, one spin on the left. So basically, you will gain uh, a factor j on the left and j on the right. Instead, the lowest uh, energy states uh, or the lowest uh, elementary excitations are what are called the uh, kinks, where basically you have a configuration where all uh, spins uh, on the left side are up or, uh, or and, and the, all the spins on the right are down or, of course, vice versa. Now, if uh, the longitudinal field now is switched on, what happens is that uh, the two configurations are no more uh, degenerate. And in particular, if you form uh, uh, configurations like uh, this one, where basically you have just one spin flip, or uh, alternatively, in this uh, kink picture, you have a kink plus an anti-kink, then you will immediately see that uh, the energy of this configuration here, of this kink anti-kink, will essentially increase uh, linearly with uh, the size of uh, this uh, a kink entity in profile. And, uh, and uh, in particular, the energy of this uh, state uh, of this configuration will increase uh, like proportion to the strength of the longitudinal field uh, times the length of uh, these two, uh, of, this, uh, um, of the number of spin down. Now, this is of course all classical. Uh, so uh, I, uh, up to now, I, I, I never switched on the, the quantum uh, Term, which is a transverse field for this discussion. But however, uh, if you think about uh, a single particle, essentially a picture, then uh, you will see that uh, by quantizing the problem, uh, a particle that will uh, feel uh, this linear potential, of course, displays uh, a, in quantum mechanics a set of uh, bound states. And the equivalent of uh, these bound states would then uh, will, will then be called the uh, mesons, and the reason is that you can see the reason why we call uh, we would call uh, these uh, sort of excitations uh, mesons in this uh, sort of schematic picture that I took from uh, this paper by Cormos and other collaborators, uh, the, which is the Nature of Physics back in 2000, uh, published in 2017. But of course, uh, this uh, mechanism of uh, of um, confinement in the ISIM model really dates back to the 60s, so it's a, a very old uh, problem. So I'm not really inventing or saying uh, anything uh, new from this perspective. What I would like to, to stress here is the following. So if uh, the uh, transverse, if the longitudinal field were switched off, then uh, what you would expect is that uh, the, the, uh, the presence of the transverse field will permit uh, the creation of uh, or the propagation of a single spin flip throughout the chain. And this is also compatible with the picture of the uh, what is called the, nowadays the Libra-Robinson bound. However, 
for Libre Robinson type of propagation. Instead, the fact that uh, here the energy of this configuration increases uh, with the, the length of the system, then uh, due to energy constraints, because the energy is of course always conserved, this uh, uh, kink anti kink or this um, or the number of uh, spin down cannot really increase uh, uh, arbitrarily. Otherwise, uh, you will uh, violate uh, the conservation of energy. Therefore, dynamically, what happens is that you need a sort of a balance between uh, the action of the transverse field, which would like to flip the spins, and the presence of this sort of confining potential induced by the longitudinal field that will uh, try to contain the uh, propagation of this uh, kink anti kink profile. And this uh, acts uh, as a sort of a as you can see here, a sort of a spring. So it's like a spring that is confining potential. So it's not precisely a spring like that, an harmonic oscillator, because it scales linearly and not quadratically. But the idea is, of course, the same. So if in a sort of quantum picture, you will be, you should be able to observe the presence of these bound states from the dynamics or arising from the propagation of a single speed flipper. Now, this can be done. I will try to zoom uh, here on these pictures. And you see, indeed, that if you plot the, the magnetization as a function of time, you see that the initial point, the, the magnetization, is uh, almost uh, close to 1, because we start, of course, from a state which is very close to the fully uh, magnetized state. But then you see that the system starts to oscillate. Instead, if uh, here uh, in this paper they just exchange x with z so but if you if you switch off the longitudinal field what you see that the magnetization will uh, uh, immediately after some time go uh, to zero but in the presence of uh, the longitudinal field uh, this, uh, the magnetization just oscillates if you take the free spectrum of uh, this magnetization you will see that uh, there are some well-defined peaks and these well-defined peaks uh, will correspond precisely to the excitations of this uh, simplified model that you see here. So basically by excitations, I mean just the energies, the eigenvalues associated to the diagonalization of this uh, linear potential that they call M1, M2, M3, etc., which I would call uh, in this uh, sort of uh, parallelism to the confinement problem, the uh, mesos. Okay? Now, interestingly enough, the same type of picture can be realized also in the context of long-range interacting systems. And in particular, uh, this is sort of quite a re recent result. There was a recent there is a, there was a, a theory paper back in 2019 by the group of Gorshkov, and more recently last year, a, an experiment in the group of Chris Moreau in uh, Maryland with, uh, with ions <clears throat> that basically realized that now the long-range uh, quantum Ising model, which is made of just two terms. So you see here that the first one will correspond to a spin coupling along the z-direction with the, that case like a power law, 1 over r to the alpha. And the second term, uh, which is just uh, the usual transverse field. What is missing here is essentially the longitudinal field that in the short-range Ising model or in the usual nearest neighbor Ising model, has to be present in order to guarantee that uh, the excitations will be uh, confined. However, and this is quite interesting, even in the absence of this longitudinal field, we can one can show that the effect of this long range is essentially to still confine the excitations. And this can be shown uh, uh, numerically, so these pictures are taken from this first paper. If you compare the dynamics of uh, uh, correlations now, of connected correlation functions uh, along the that direction, either in the, both in the short range limit and in the long range one. So you see that here in the short range limit, basically there is no confinement at all. So the correlation will spread ballistically. Instead, uh, if you take uh, a, a long range interaction, so when where the power law is uh, the order of 0.6 or even smaller 2.3, you see that now the, all these correlations are, are basically confined. And you see that they, not propagate, they do not propagate uh, linearly, but they just uh, are confined, like in the usual uh, in the, uh, picture in the schema 
pictorial presentation that I was showing before. Now, how to explain this? Well, uh, one can, uh, uh, again, uh, resort to a simplified model that I would call uh, the two kink model, where you have one kink uh, at position J and one other, another kink at position, at position J plus N. So you can, uh, if you um, act uh, on uh, with Hamiltonian, or the long range adding Hamiltonian, on this state uh, JN, where J is the initial spin of where you have the first kink and N, the second kink, you will see that you get uh, this type of uh, term, which consists of a sort of uh, uh, local potential, V of N, plus uh, a coupling, uh, plus um, a set of uh, terms which depend on B, which is uh, the strength of the transverse field. Now, you can diagonalize uh, the Hamiltonian, or you can rewrite the Hamiltonian, taking into account essentially the translational symmetry along the x direction, so along the direction of the chain. So you basically take the Fourier transform, and we get uh, an effective model where basically for each uh, wave number uh, k, we obtain a local term, which is a local external potential, plus uh, a hopping term. So you will see that uh, now the, uh, the configuration where the, you have uh, a kink uh, anti-kink at distance n is coupled to a kink anti-kink configuration n plus one and uh, also n minus one. So this term here will play the role of the hopping. This term will play the role of a local external potential. And now the whole thing is that uh, what is the shape of this local external potential? So you can compute it analytically. It's a combination of uh, the Riemann zeta function plus other terms so that scales as the intrinsic power low one over half to the alpha. And when you plot it, you see that they have uh, this potential have this shape. So either the red line for alpha equal to 2.9 or uh, this green line for alpha equal to 2.3. And if you diagonalize it, uh, uh, what you observe uh, will be that uh, there will be some a certain number of uh, bound states, which is extremely similar to the, to the feature that I was showing before. So at the end of the day, just uh, you can see this problem, this effective problem as an opting problem in the presence of an external confining uh, potential. And therefore, you will expect as well the presence of uh, meson excitations, which indeed were measured uh, recently in uh, this type of uh, experiments uh, with the uh, Rydberg ions. And here you see again uh, the, the propagation of excitations and and correlation from the original experiment that was realized by varying the long range coupling to much smaller values of the order of z from 0.8 to uh, 1.1. Okay, so with this, I think that uh, I'm uh, basically closer to the conclusion. I just want to mention that, of course, this model can be generalized, and this has been done recently in a paper by, again, uh, Alexei Gorshkov to uh, a large number of colors, essentially. Instead of having just uh, two spins, uh, we can consider three colors, so up, uh, red, and, and, and green, or three states. And this mod, the generalization of the Eslin model goes under the name of a POTS model. And with the POTS uh, model, in principle, one should be able to realize not only mesonic excitation, so here the model is just slightly more complicated, but also baryonic uh, uh, configurations in analogy to what we would expect for the case of, uh, um, will be in analogy to high energy uh, physics uh, where this uh, confinement uh, uh, problem was initially uh, studied uh, in a more deep uh, uh, fashion. Okay, so with this, I think that I would like to uh, conclude uh, the discussion of uh, applications of long range interactions to uh, many body systems. They, um, I hope that I was able to convey the message uh, during these three lectures that uh, the long-range systems are indeed extremely interesting. They are a very broad uh, area of research and uh, also that you can basically approach uh, this field with different, really different techniques and with different uh, um, objectives. If you are interested in the field of body physics, uh, typically you can restrict your uh, interest or your attention to the scattering properties. If uh, you're interested in the field of uh, uh, 
in thermodynamics or uh, statistical mechanics more in general, then one should really understand how the problem can be scaled to the thermodynamic limit. And therefore, uh, questions like the presence of uh, phase transitions and how correlate at the scaling of the correlations become uh, relevant when you uh, switch on long range interactions. And the final uh, point that I wanted to address in the last lecture was uh, how long range interaction affect uh, many body systems uh, with uh, either particles that move in free space or uh, spin systems like the one that I was displaying here in uh, this uh, um, long range uh, Ising model. So with this, uh, I would like to uh, conclude. I hope that uh, I was able to convey effectively this, uh, this message. I want to reiterate that, of course, I'm available uh, for, uh, for the discussions. And if you guys have any questions, just uh, uh, drop me an email. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, and I'm available for questions, uh, Manuel. Thank you, Tommaso. Uh, do we have questions here? Yes, Vandeli. Hey, hi, Tomas. Uh, my question hi, is: Yeah, my question is when you spoke about uh, the quantum crystals, yes, or quantum crystallization, is that uh, related to the well-known Wigner quantum crystals? It, it is indeed. It is. So there are, of course, different types of uh, Wigner crystal situation. So the uh, it, uh, the the Wigner crystal is the, in some sense, was introduced to understand the crystallization in the case of uh, electronic systems. There, of course, you have on top of a single uh, interaction between uh, electrons, of course, you have also interaction between electrons and, and the ions. Here, in, the same, in a sense, we are considering a toy model, but it is a toy model that uh, um, can be uh, very well, very much controlled within the physics of travel systems and it's also very much tunable in the sense that uh, the interaction can be as i commented can be either truly long range scaling as a one over r to the alpha or it can be non local now the important thing uh, is that i would like to emphasize it again depending on uh, whether the uh, the interaction is uh, just purely repulsive or uh, can be anisotropic you can have uh, i would say a much broader uh, much broader features than the original uh, the crystal, but nevertheless, of course, the inspiration uh, comes from uh, precisely the, the, the original work by Wigner uh, almost 100 years ago. I fully agree. Uh, do you have further questions here? Um, okay, we have a question from YouTube, Tommaso. Uh, Dalila mentions the page 14 of her presentation. Um, okay. I don't know if we can put it up on screen. Yes. Okay, here we are. Yes. So the, the, she mentions the order parameter, then determines the ordering of the system. Then she asks, so the theta B is controlled for the lattice potential or is it something that comes up naturally for the interaction of the particles in the lattice? No, no, very good question. So, uh, okay, so uh, the, 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 there are, I think, two questions. So first of all, uh, what determines the, the ordering? The ordering depends on the, uh, basically, the density of the system and the type of interaction. So for this case, we consider a, 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 this a two-scale interaction, which is uh, this hard core plus soft core. And if you tune these parameters to very specific values, for example, here we are taking uh, epsilon equal to 7, uh, the ratio between uh, sigma 1 and sigma 0 equal to 1.95. And we also fix the density. I don't, ah, okay, here we vary, for example, we, in these pictures we vary the density. I don't remember precisely the densities of these two snapshots. 
Uh, but basically, these are the quantities that uh, control the many body phase. Now, the theta b is, uh, the can be defined as, the, as uh, based on the configuration. So, suppose that you have a certain configuration. Now, we want to, we can define the, the angles between uh, formed by uh, the particles by essentially three particles. So, you, have fi you fix uh, one particle, let's say i, particle i, and then you have nearest neighbor nearest neighboring particles okay so for these three particles you define you can define two edges so the angle between these two uh, edges basically is you call it a theta b of course you now you can sum over all uh, the bonds okay so and then uh, therefore so you can sum over all the angles or in particular all the phases uh, e to i and b theta b and then uh, you, you can repeat this calculation for different types of m. So you can play with the m equal to 6, you can play with m equal to 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And you see that the only relevant ones uh, for this particular uh, problem and for these uh, phases are just m equal to 6 and m equal to 12. So, but this is an order parameter, so it's something that you can extract once you reach equilibrium in your uh, simulation uh, is not something that intrinsically is uh, is defined by the um, by the parameters of the simulation so the parameters of the simulation will uh, produce uh, some equilibrium state and then you can start to test uh, the properties of the equilibrium state by looking at different uh, parameters such as uh, the bond order or the energy which can be either kinetic or potential energy etc Thank you. Um, further questions here? I don't see. So, Tommaso, thank you again for the three lectures. We are looking forward to meet you in person sometime this year. So, let's thank Tommaso again. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Bye, Manuel.